G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. And before the episode begins, I would like to give Native another huge shout out for sponsoring this video. Native is a great company that provides safe, simple, effective products that people use in the bathroom daily. Their products are formulated without aluminium, parabens, and talc, and instead are filled with ingredients found in nature. And Native have been super generous and allowed me to try some of their products, and I've been using them for some time now, and the product has been reliably fantastic since day one. I recently ordered more of the deodorants and the service for delivery was great again. I've been using the citrus and the herbal musk deodorant and the smell is always super fragrant. A little bit more subtle than the eucalyptus and mint but still really good. And what I've noticed about this one too is that just like the eucalyptus, it lasted both on body and also in product really nicely. I'm a pretty busy guy and I've actually begun hiking a bit recently and the deodorant that I received and the stuff I've ordered through them honestly has never let me down and it's always kept me smelling super fresh even on some of those long hikes that I go on and although Native is priced at a slight premium compared to conventional deodorants it's really safe and effective. The selection is really big and along with some great reviews from customers there's something for everyone on their website. Some of the scents that they have are coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, and my favourite, the eucalyptus one. They also have free shipping and returns and even offer a completely unscented formula and baking soda free formula for people with sensitivities. So, for 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use the promo code SCARED during checkout. That's 20% off your first purchase at N-A-T-I-V-E d-e-o-d-o-r-a-n-t dot com and use the promo code s-c-a-r-e-d at the checkout. I hope you guys take up Native on their generous offer and without further ado, let's begin. So, the main incident that occurred was also witnessed by my boyfriend. It happened in our child's room, and for context, our four-year-old son's room is located directly across the hall from our room, and we can see it from our bed. In my son's room, there's some jackets hanging up on some hooks on the back of the door, and this is a detail that comes up later in the story, and we've lived in this house for about three years and never had something like this happen before. So, we're sitting in bed on our phones just getting ready to go to sleep when we both hear our son jump out of bed and run across his room to his door. His door is like halfway shut so I can't actually see into his room but as I looked up I saw the door move like he bumped into it. My boyfriend jumps up to go put our son back to bed and after a minute or so my boyfriend comes back out of the room looking kind of freaked out and whispers he's fast asleep and he didn't get out of bed. I climb out of bed thinking that my son is just pretending to be asleep or something and walk in to see him definitely asleep, breathing slowly under the covers how we tucked him in earlier. My boyfriend and I are both kind of like, what the heck to each other? Wondering what the heck just happened and we sort of just settle back into bed when something that makes this so much weirder happens maybe about half an hour later. So my son wakes up whimpering and we get up to go and check on him. He's pointing at the door where the jackets are hanging up and says, there's a monster playing with my jacket. I flip on the light and look around and I can't see anything and my first thought was maybe some sort of animal got into our house and that's what we heard or what we just saw. So I look around the room trying to see if there's a mouse or something. Our house is really small and clean so there's not really many places for an animal to hide and I can't find anything. Plus, my son kept insisting that the monster was still behind the door, playing with his jacket. Additionally, the footsteps that we heard were pretty loud and honestly really sounded like my son, so it just didn't make much sense that there was a small animal in here. But my son wouldn't go back to sleep alone after this, so my boyfriend laid down with him so he would feel safe. This was honestly just such an odd event. I mean, my son never talked about monsters or being scared before this. It was just so out of nowhere and so weird that we heard the footsteps as well. And ever since then, my son will sometimes wake up crying about a monster in his room. I honestly wish that I could find an explanation for what we heard. I mean, if we hadn't heard the footsteps, I would have probably just dismissed my son's monster's claims and not think much about it. 
Do you guys have any ideas of what we could do or any rational explanation? For a little backstory, I was 17 at the time and when I was 12 my stepfather moved us from the city to the small town where he grew up. But let's just say it was not an easy transition. But most kids had grown up there and everyone had a very tight social group and boy, they sure did not like me. Some of you may get what I mean. Any friends that I thought I had in the beginning were simply looking for ways to make my life hell. But this was one of those everyone knows your business towns so anything I divulged got manipulated and then became public knowledge. And I was utterly depressed at the time. But kids can just be so mean, right? So, fast forward to high school, I had a small group of people that I could talk to and I had decided to care less about what was being said about me. During my sophomore year, I struck up an unlikely friendship with one of the most popular girls in school, Casey. She was a girl that all the guys wanted to be with and all the girls envied her. She would defend me if anyone said anything and I honestly worshipped this girl. And she liked me because I wasn't fake like the other girls in her school. And she had a nasty temper, fortunately never directed at me, that some people didn't know how to handle. I've always been good in adapting to personalities and knowing when it's best to leave people alone, so we always got along very well. But Casey, she had a wild streak and would get into lots of trouble when she wasn't with me. I didn't care too much and neither did my mum as long as I was not involved. Looking back though, I was really naive and I honestly believe that she intentionally kept me away from that because she was territorial over me. I was her one relationship and she didn't want to risk losing me. That is, until she met Rex. Towards the end of my summer before my senior year, I began to see less and less of Casey. She had met Rex and was doing whatever she could do to be where he was and he was in his 20s and was always having parties or something. I worked and I had a strict curfew so it wasn't like I could just go out with her but I had other friends now and didn't give her a hard time about it. Two weeks into the school year and Casey and I made plans to have an all weekend sleepover. We were going to color her hair and watch some movies and absorb every bit of the sun we could before the cold weather set in, so that Friday she picked me up after my shift. We dropped her stuff off at my place and then went to the Walmart to buy hair color, and while there, she got a call from one of Rex's friends. Apparently, he was having a huge party and had invited her. To be honest, I expected her to just blow me off right then and there, but to my surprise, she asked if I were cool with heading over there for a little bit. I agreed and told my mum that we were going to go drive around a bit. There was no way my mum would have been fine with it and we had just told her that we'd be back in a bit. So the party was out by a lake and it took a series of country roads to get to. But when we arrived I only knew one other person there and we spoke briefly before they left. After this I was left to my own devices pretty much. Casey had disappeared with Rex and I didn't see her again for another hour or so. She and several of the girls were making their way to the door when I caught up to her. She said that they were going to go and get some cigarettes and would be back in 20. I asked if she would drop me off at home, but she said that there wasn't any room. Needless to say, I was upset, but I parked myself on the couch and tried to socialize with those who were left. Two hours later, and she hadn't returned and was ignoring my calls. Two hours later, and she had not returned and was ignoring my calls. I was angry and hurt and most of all scared, but those who were left, about 15 people, were gathered in front of me with a large amount of meth and pipes and syringes and they offered me some, which I politely refused, but no one pushed it on to me. Yet, my phone had 2% battery and I couldn't reach my sister or her boyfriend, who sadly knew where I was. Now, it's been about four hours since she was gone and I'm sitting alone with this guy Brad, He's been altering between meth and weed the entire night, and once we were alone, he insists I join him. I made up an excuse that I had a brain aneurysm and told him that I didn't want to risk it. I also said that my job would drug test me for the weed. But this did not deter him for long, as he was just completely gone at this point. He honestly only stopped long enough to hit on me, and I told him no and begged him to stop. I was a virgin at the time, and this was not how I wanted to lose it. 
he went back for one last round before trudging off to the bathroom, and I know most of you are thinking that you'd be walking home at this point. I'll tell you that I was at least 20 miles from home and at least 5 miles to the nearest house. I had no idea where I was and fear will make you just do stupid things. I tried looking for a landline but no dice. And then out of nowhere I'm being pulled by my hair to the couch. Brad was angry that I turned him down and screaming did no good because we were the only ones there. He sat on top of my legs and held my arms above with one hand and blew smoke from his joint into my face. I had never liked the smell or taste, I'm not judging anyone who enjoys it, but it's just not for me. As I choke over the smoke, he's trying to remove his basketball shorts while feeling me up and I'm crying and begging and telling him no. And just then, the person who lived there runs through the front door with a baseball bat in hand. Apparently, he had acted as a designated driver to his buddies. He heard my screams from the driveway and got in as quick as he could. Unfortunately, he wasn't quick enough to catch my assaulter, but boy was I grateful. I mean, had he been another minute, things would have been considerably worse for me. He begs me not to call the police because he was already on probation and does not want to go to prison for the paraphernalia, so I stupidly agree. This guy saved me and I didn't want to return the favor with incarceration or anything. He offers to take me home at this point and just as we're walking to his truck, Casey pulls up with Rex and the girls that she left with. And man, she is totally messed up. I had never seen her that way before and I later found out that she had went two hours away to score meth, even though there was plenty to go around at the party. The guy who lived there filled her, Rex and the others in on what had transpired. She wouldn't even look at me and she asked one of the other girls to take me home and left with Rex. Pretty awful, right? Never had I or have I since been so betrayed and to make matters worse, the girl who drove me home threatened to harm me if I ever told anyone else about what happened. She said that I know where you live. I arrived home shortly after sunrise. Apparently, Casey had sent my mum a text. She pretended to be me and said that my phone had died and that we decided to stay the night at her place. My mum had no reason to be worried about me and it took me days to tell her what happened. My sister's boyfriend beat the crap out of Brad. Casey and I were never the same after and it took me two months to reach out to her again. Some of you might wonder why and to me, as much as she portrayed me, it was worse for me to write her off when she needed me the most even if she had done the same. But my mother had seen her around and told me that she was in really bad shape and was obviously using hard drugs. Her and I now live states away and we talk occasionally, but she's doing much better these days. As far as Brad is concerned, he did eventually go to prison on drug-related charges, I think, and I don't know where he is now, but I still get anxious when I go to visit my family. I mean, it is a small town and it wouldn't be hard to run into him if he were there. So, I'd like to start off by saying that I'm not religious. I used to be, and I even studied many religions and theology for some time, but I don't subscribe to any one. So, when it comes to dark spirits and all that sort of stuff, I just don't really believe in it. That being said, when I was a kid I was on the highway with my grandma. I lived in Oahu, Hawaii, and we were driving on the Pali Highway. My grandma was driving and her headlights were on pretty high because it was dark. And on the right side of the road, I, I swear to you that I saw a shadow person. I passed by it. No chance that it was a person because I could make out the features of the grass and the plants around it. The second time, I was getting some snacks when I was a teenager. I was at the fridge and to the left of my fridge was a hallway and a set of stairs. I closed the fridge and turned left and saw a shadow-like thing. Darker than the dark of night, it was night time when this happened and the rest of the room looked brighter than the being, even in the complete darkness at like 2am. And the shadow thing just basically flew up the stairs. Interesting to note too that there was no sound. It kind of makes your senses confused because you're not used to seeing things that move that quickly but make no sound as well. But anyway, it flew up the stairs and flew straight through me, like doing an owl type of swooping thing down on me. 
Although I didn't feel anything, and I wouldn't say my life has been unlucky or unfortunate or that my life is bad in any way since then, so I'm not cursed or possessed or whatever, it just kind of went through me like I wasn't even important. Also, a side note, when I saw the being this time, when I looked at it, I got the feeling of seeing something like a, a tornado or some sort of natural powerful thing. I wasn't scared, but more respectful, I suppose. Just a feeling, but a strange one. Whenever I thought about seeing a ghost or something, I always thought that I'd freak out, but no. So, since it's pretty clear in my memory, even being in my mid-twenties and this stuff all happened when I was still below 18, I figured that I should write a description of what I saw as best as I can. So, a shadow person, or at least the things I've seen, look very, very, very black. Like, a zero light will reflect off of it. If you look up Vanta Black, which is one of the blackest materials ever created by man, it comes kind of close. However, I've seen videos of people shining light on Vanta Black at a certain point and it just looks white. So, it's not quite the same. But imagine if Vanta Black stayed that pure black, even if you shined insane amounts of light upon it. Imagine the purest void black that no light can enter, which borders upon color and light that's impassable. Now, take that and put it in a, a human form with a, a feathery kind of fuzzy hazy outline just on the rim of it. Not crazy with tendrils or anything, but just enough of a hazy outline to make it look slightly like a shadow, but firm enough of a border to make sure that you know it's not a shadow. Kind of like the human shape is leaking into this world. Now, the thing is, is from my fridge experience, this form can take a, a lot of shapes too. So basically, in my experience, shadow people are sort of shapeshifty as well. But when they move, they don't animate, they just kind of float along in a direction. So for this, a good example I've seen is when somebody does no clip in a video game. Which, if you don't know what that looks like, go ahead and YouTube it. It's kind of an accurate example of what I experienced in the fridge situation anyway. So basically, it's blacker than the blackest black that you could ever think of. Almost like a void and to the point where you almost can't believe you're seeing it. Shape-shifting but human in form in my experiences. Silent, incredibly fast moving but when moving has no animation. And the weird thing is, is that after this all happened, I haven't really had any experience with shadow people again. As an adult, I haven't seen anything like that since. I've had some other weird experiences since then. Restaurants are pretty much always haunted, right? And I'm a chef. But no shadow people. This story doesn't involve me directly, but I was there when everything went down. This happened about a year ago. I used to spend every day at my best friend's apartment building, which was kind of a weird setup. When you walk into the apartment from the hallway, there's a living room and a kitchen area, and then you walk down a hallway where all the rooms were lined up next to each other, and she lived in a big apartment building where each unit was set up similarly and shared a balcony with the apartment next door. Both units have a glass door that leads onto this balcony as well. Due to the layout, in order for each bedroom to have a window, there's an empty space with the width of the balcony between the two neighboring units that share it. This also means that your bedroom window directly looks into the neighbor's bedroom window from about 15 feet away. So, my friend and I were in the living room watching a movie on a Saturday night when one of her roommates scurried into the living room looking terrified and exclaimed that there's a man staring at me from the window next door. She explained that all the lights in the apartment have been off all weekend, so she assumed that all the girls next door had gone home for the weekend. It was a set of college apartments in a dangerous neighborhood. She had the blinds cracked open and was laying on her bed when she saw movement from the dark room next door. She looked over and there was a pair of eyes staring at her from the dark, and at first she thought that she was nuts, but a minute later saw a large dark arm pressed up against the glass and the eyes emerged again. But the lights were already off in the living room and we all crouched down and gathered around the glass back door to watch the windows of the apartment next door to see if anyone was inside. And sure enough, after a minute through the blinds, we saw someone moving around and flickering lights on and off. This made us all really nervous because he could easily walk onto the back porch and then the only thing standing between him and us would be a glass door. 
We were all pretty freaked out, but reasoned that maybe one of the girls had given her boyfriend a keycard and he was the one inside. On the other hand, the apartments were super easy to break into. I mean, you swipe a card down the lock and you're pretty much in. There were about 50 units in the building and there was a huge problem with robberies though. The next day, I was over again and we heard the girls come home. We went out into the back porch and knocked on their door and when we told them what happened, their faces went pale as they explained that nobody was home and nobody should have been inside the apartment. After informing the building manager of what happened, they all gathered their belongings and they went somewhere else for the night. Unfortunately, the building manager didn't really care or do anything about it, but a few months later, everyone just pretty much moved out. But nobody knew who he was or how he got into the building in the first place since there's a security guard sitting at a desk by the front door. The whole situation was just really weird and kind of unexplainable, but the creepiest part was the fact that the guy was just so brazen and just stood there staring at us. So about two years ago, my family and I stayed in a hotel in this city called Isfahan in Iran. We got two rooms in this hotel, don't remember the name, but we have pictures. One room was for my aunt and uncle on a different floor, and another was for my mum, dad, sister, and me. My mum and dad had a room that had a door access from the bathroom, and my sister and I had two twin beds. That was sort of in a, a bigger open living room type space, but we could still see the bathroom from where we slept. That night, I was reading on my Kindle and the lights were off and suddenly I had this paralyzing fear that if I put my Kindle down, someone's face would be right there staring at me. It was completely dark and I assumed my sister was asleep because I heard nothing from her, but I just couldn't put my Kindle down because I was frozen with fear. I couldn't even change the page, so I just kept rereading the same thing over and over again and all of a sudden I heard a smack sound against the wall and I jumped, threw my Kindle on the ground and hid under the blankets until I eventually saw my mum get up and go to the bathroom and the thought that someone was awake calmed me down a bit. I still couldn't sleep because, well, I was still on edge and I later saw my mum go to the bathroom like three times and in my head I thought that she ate some bad food or something. In the morning my parents asked us how we slept and I told them what had happened. I mentioned to my mum, you didn't sleep too much too, and I kept seeing you go to the bathroom, and my mother looked at me and goes, I didn't go to the bathroom, you did. I was surprised, and so was my sister, who also believed it was my mother who was in the bathroom, but she said that she also couldn't sleep and thought that she saw my mum go. My dad chimed in and said that he thought it was also me too. In other words, we all saw someone go to the bathroom like three or four times during the night and it had a womanly shape. We were all shocked and decided that we shouldn't tell my aunt and uncle about what we saw because they probably would think that we're crazy or something. We meet up with them for breakfast and ask how their night was, to which my aunt said, I woke up and there were three women staring at me and they were all mad. So I want to start off by saying that I don't actually believe in ghosts myself. I grew up very superstitious, but once I grew into adulthood, I, I didn't think paranormal explanations made any sense, and I'm still agnostic to the existence of spirits. I'm still agnostic to the existence of spirits. Still though, paranormal encounter stories really excite me, and I love hearing them and suspending my disbelief. Anyways, when I was younger, I had a great aunt who was psychic. Not the typical kind that reads your future or anything. She was a staunch Catholic and basically just knew stuff that she had no way of knowing. She always saw it as a gift from God or something. To give an example, one time my mum was pregnant with my older sister. She experienced some bleeding and went to the hospital. Only her and my dad knew that she was there, but not long after, she received a call from her aunt asking, well, what's wrong with the baby? There are more examples, but this is the only one I can remember off the top of my head. Her daughters, my mum's cousins, thought that they had a bit of that gift too, though not as prominent, obviously. These relatives lived up in the Adirondacks, and every year during the summer, we used to visit them. 
I guess when I was around three, we planned another trip up, but one morning about a week before the trip, my mum woke up, opened her eyes, and for a split second, saw a white figure at the foot of her bed. She thought it was really weird, but said nothing, until it happened again and again, every day for a week. Finally, she told my dad, who froze and said, I've been seeing that too. Weirded out, they continued with the trip as planned, and during a night around a campfire, they told my mum's cousin about it, and her immediate response was, Watch your children. Someone's telling you to watch your children. And that obviously really spooked them, but they didn't know what to make of it. Sometime into the trip, we as a family went to the cemetery when my mum's mum was buried to visit graves and whatnot, and I don't remember any of this, but from what I'm told, I stood with my dad, who was a little ways away from my mum and sister. He was busy with something, and I asked where mum was. Over that hill, he told Tiny Toddler me and pointed to a small hill in the cemetery. I saw the bigger hill the road followed, and eventually my mum and dad met up again, both asking where I was. Panic set in and my mum suddenly remembered the fireside convo with her cousin. They didn't watch me and I went missing in the Adirondacks. And they still haven't found me to this day. I'm joking, I'm joking. After a lot of panicking and searching, they obviously found me sitting outside a gas station up the road crying my little eyes out. But I guess the moral of this story is that if you see spooky white figures in your room, don't let your toddlers wander about graveyards in the mountains, or something like that. Uh, honestly though, there's some big animals and weird people up there, so I was pretty lucky. Or maybe luck had nothing to do with it. So at the time of this story, I'd just turned 17 and was still pretty naive. I live in England, so it's legal to work in a bar and serve alcohol supervised, but not to drink alcohol. Not that that stopped me anyway. And I worked in a working men's club filled with middle-aged elderly people, and most were pretty nice. I sold bingo tickets twice a week for my dad's cousin, and I was pretty good at it. It's not typical to get tips here, but I earned more in tips than I did in my actual wage. On a Saturday, my dad would come with me to have a drink with my older sister while they played competitive darts in the main bar overlooking my booth. This one particular night, there was a, a middle-aged average looking guy, a little on the plump side but generally unnoticeable, and on the first round of selling tickets, he was at the fruit machine opposite the entire time, looking over at me occasionally. During the second round, he approached me, asked what I was selling and how bingo worked, etc., Clearly had never played before, but hey, everyone starts somewhere, right? He bought some tickets and offered to buy me a drink, and I declined and informed him that I was underage. But by now, I had a bit of an uneasy vibe and didn't want to take a drink from a guy that I didn't know. He then offered a cola, complimenting me a little too hard. Again, I declined and went on my way to help with the game in the main hall, part of my job. The third time, he stood against the wall adjacent to me and just watched me work. He waited until the queue calmed down and bragged about how much money he had and how he wants to be my sugar daddy, how cute I am, commenting on my figure and my boobs and my butt and all that sort of stuff and I was trapped in my booth and I was laid into the main hall so the concert chairman, the guy who calls out the bingo numbers and gives out winnings, comes out and asks what was going on. This guy claims that we're just talking. I apologized to the chairman and he walked into the hall, said that he could see that I was freaked out, so I told him everything. He made the bar staff aware, who also made my boss, my dad's cousin, aware also. Last round of selling tickets and he doesn't even wait for me to get back into my booth. He just grabs my ass, telling me how he wants to be my sugar daddy once again, tries to push me against the wall and is suddenly spun around. Not just by my dad, but by my boss and numerous staff members and customers who heard and saw what went down. He started arguing his innocence until my dad not so politely introduced himself. And at that point, he knew that he was screwed. But my dad punched him in the nose, blood running down his face. Everyone picked him up a, a plank of wood and just threw him out of the closed door. And I never saw him after that. Everyone checked up on me to make sure I was okay. My sister covered the rest of my shift and I was bought so many drinks that I had a free bar tab for two months after that. 
I'm really thankful to my dad and all the other guys in that place for keeping an eye on me. I work as a waitress at a restaurant and it's normal for me to get a few creeps being creepy towards me because, well, I have pretty big breasts and my design to be loose work shirt is still tight across my chest so it's very obvious that they're pretty big. I'm pretty much used to the attention by now and all of the catcalls and such are just part of the background noise to me at this point. But last week, there was this guy who I was serving, probably mid-twenties, somewhat good looking, probably used to getting girls with little to no effort, and anyway, he told me that he would be leaving the best tip of my life. I got excited because I was thinking he was going to leave like 50 or or hundred dollars or something. Yeah, I have bills to pay, but instead of leaving me a cash tip, he left his phone number and a note to call him for the best night of my life. Obviously, I was a, a bit disappointed to have been stiff like that, but I threw away the note and just forgot about the whole thing. Until yesterday. He came in again and sat in my section. When I went to take his order, he asked if I'd gotten his note. I lied and said that the busser must have thrown it away or something. He saw past my lie though and told me that I should really be ashamed of myself for disrespecting him like that. I told him that I have a fiancé, but I may as well have told him that I have a pet rock because he said, I'm getting that date with you. I asked one of my co-workers if he'd take the table instead and he understood and took it. But that wasn't the end of it. I take the bus home and that customer just happened to be taking the same bus. This made me uncomfortable and I texted my fiancé and he met me at the bus stop. And, sure enough, the creep got off at my stop. He tried acting like he and I were friends, but my fiancé put his arm around me and politely asked him to leave. The creep said, you think you can be a real man to her? He was obviously trying to challenge my fiancé, but luckily he's smarter than that and just said, leave me alone and have a good day, before turning us around and walking to our apartment. That was yesterday evening, and luckily nothing has happened since, but my manager said that if he gives me any more trouble to let her know and she'll deal with it. Of all the creeps I've come across in all my years of being a waitress, this is the first time that I've been truly weirded out. Hopefully last night's encounter was the end of it, but I guess I'll just have to wait and see. So this story takes place near Fort Bragg, NC, where I went to college four years ago. Anyone who's familiar with the area knows that it has a large population of homeless vets near the base. Now, I had just turned 20 years old and had moved out of the house for college over two hours away. I had previously worked at a nursing home for two years, so I have a special place in my heart for the struggling elderly. My roommate and I, who was male, moved into a little apartment near the college and bought a rinky-dink washer and dryer set off Craigslist. Well, the washer didn't last a week until it went out, and we had to start using a laundromat. My roommate was busy with homework, so I offered to do his laundry for him if he would do mine next week, and he agreed. So I grabbed a bag with laundry accessories, my phone, school books, about $15 in quarters, and our clothes in a dirty hamper, and I left. Now, the layout of the laundromat was, at the front of the store there were two rows of washers and then two rows of dryers near the back then the dryers on the walls on the left hand side near the front and then there were two tables a kitty corner to each other but one at the front left hand side and one at the back right hand side then the chairs lining the left of the walls at the laundromat i threw all of our laundry into a machine and pulled out one of my books for school to start studying i was sitting at the table closest to the exit towards the front out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman with a child sitting down on the chairs to the left. I see an elderly man with a military hat standing in the middle aisle getting frustrated with the machine and it was really hard to watch and I felt obligated to help him. I grabbed my bag with all my laundry stuff to come to his aid and ask him if he would care for some help with the washer. He said yes and I looked at his washer and he had no soap and was missing a quarter in the slots. As I got closer, I could smell his very potent stench of body odor coming from his laundry. I offered him a Tide Pod and gave him a quarter and he thanked me and then walked back over to the front tables. I picked up my book to start reading and he catches the corner of my eye again and he was taking all of his clothes off and putting them in the dryer and 
he was now only in a white undershirt tank top and his shorts. At this point, I come to realize that this man's homeless and might have a few screws loose, so I should probably be careful. I watch him walk over to the other table near the back of the store and then walk towards my table with a big trash bag and sits down on the other side of the table. I smile at him and he smiles back, showing most of his teeth were missing and that his canines were very much decayed. He starts to small talk with me until there was an awkward silence. I could tell that he was really lonely and just wanted to talk, so yet again I just feel bad for him and I try and strike up a conversation. I ask him about his military hat and he got a flash of pride in his eye and tells me that he was a veteran that fought in Vietnam and starts to tell me about all the things he used to do for the military and when he was finishing telling me, I told him that my stepdad was a Korean vet and I had a lot of respect for those who served and thanked him for his service. He asked me how my stepdad was and I told him that he actually died of cancer when I was younger but I loved him very much. And he looks me dead in the eye and tells me that he was sorry about my father, but I could call him daddy at any time and then puts his hat on me. <laughs> at this point, I kind of started to freak out a bit, thinking that this man probably has lice, so I took it off relatively calmly and handed back to him. I wasn't sure if he was trying to be funny or not, but I told him that he was kind of making me a bit uncomfortable and I needed to be left alone anyway for my studies. He nodded and took his bag over to the other table. A few minutes passed and the lady and her kids that were sitting to the left leave and just like clockwork, he comes over to sit with me again and this time with his bag. He came over and apologizes to me and explained that he didn't mean to be rude and gave me a bag of candy. I tried to decline, telling him that I have a dairy allergy. I actually do, but he refuses and puts it inside my bag of soaps. I say thank you and he nods and sits back down. I try to ignore him and he started to make these noises like he's in pain and to get my attention or something. Like he was having some sort of flare up or something. I ask if he's okay and he said yes I'm just getting old and I kind of giggle at this and then he tells me I'm sorry but I have to tell you you have the most beautiful red hair I've ever seen. You remind me of my girlfriend. I ask him to hold on and I switch my clothes over in the dryer. So I ask him about his girlfriend and when I return he tells me that she died of a heroin overdose two months ago. I tell him that I'm really sorry to hear that and he then asks if I would be his girlfriend. And without a second thought I then try and convince him that I'm underage and that that would be highly inappropriate. I'm 4'11 and about 100 pounds so I figured it would have been believable. But he then tells me that he doesn't care and can keep a secret. And then touches my hand that's on the table where he sat across from me. At this point, shivers went up my spine and I told him that, I'm sorry sir, but no, I have a boyfriend, and pulled my hand away to text my roommate to come help me now. At this point, his gaze seems rather predatory and my heart begins to beat out of my chest. I put my book down inside my bag and I start gathering my things to just get the heck out of there. I'm trying to be slow enough not to alarm him or provoke unwanted behavior. I was wearing a tank top and sweatpants at the time and he then comments that he can see my cleavage and they look like nice breasts and all sorts of other really depraved things. I stopped acknowledging him and threw my bag into the bottom of my hamper, started walking to the dryer where my clothes were, still sopping wet, and started shoveling them as fast as I could into the hamper. All during this time, he's telling me how he would take me to a hotel and do all these really horribly graphic things to me if he had the money, and that he had 60 years of experience in pleasuring women. I'm still trying to ignore him and have almost gotten all of my clothes, and then he either picks up underwear that had fallen onto the floor in my scramble or had taken them from the hamper whilst I wasn't paying attention. The bright blue thong catches my eye and then I look at him. I look at him dead in the eye as he flicks his tongue through the space of his missing front teeth like a snake. He starts bringing up my underwear to his face which I snatch so fast that it startles him. He starts hightailing it to his back to the back of the mat and I panic at this point and head to the door with all my belongings. I've honestly never seen an old man run so fast. He grabs his bag and runs toward me asking for a ride to a nearby town if I wait for him. He grabs my shoulder and I struggle to open the door and then I scream loud and I have some pipes on me and he freezes. 
I make it out of the door and then to my car without hearing him behind me and uh, my guess was that he was looking around the parking lot and the laundromat making sure that no one was around and I'm not sure I wasn't paying attention. I threw my laundry into the back seat and then he starts walking out to my car. He arrives at it just as I was getting in and locking my doors, asking for a ride again, pulling on my door handles, begging and crying. I leave having a total panic attack and I get home and wake up my roommate and just start bawling my eyes out and I tell him everything that happened and made him promise me that he would go with me next time. I'm not sure why I didn't just leave with the laundry and then come back with my roommate in the first place. I'm not sure why I did a lot of those things that led to it. I guess it's hard to have a clear head in stressful situations, right? All I know is that I'm glad that I made it out when I did because the whole situation was just going downhill quickly. When I was young, I lived in a house in California a three bedroom building with a a common identical layout to the other homes in the neighborhood and it was haunted by just many different things. In fact, I have recently taken up chronicling my early experiences in that house. Now, at the end of our hallway, we had a large old heater with a pilot light that you had to ignite very carefully and next to that was the light switch for the hallway. Every night before bed, I would have to brush my teeth, which meant turning on the light at the end of the hallway. And before bed every night, something was always waiting for me underneath that light switch. It was a a squatting male looking figure standing menacingly at the end of the hallway. Its head would always face backwards, though the neck didn't look twisted or broken or anything. It wore dirty looking overalls, a, a crushed straw farmer's hat, muddy boots and a red flannel shirt. It held what looked like some kind of farming tool and the smile on its lips and the thing made it just look hungry if that makes sense. But it just kind of stood there watching me like it was waiting for me to make my move. Gathering all the courage that I could muster, I would always close my eyes tight, run to the end of the hallway and throw on the light switch. I would always expect to open my eyes to see it standing right in front of me, but it was like it just would vanish once the light was turned on. But the area where it once stood just always felt really cold and lingering in the air was this scent of rotted vegetables or something like old lettuce or cabbage. I'm curious if this description matches anyone else's experiences. Have you seen anything like this and if so, where? Let me just start by saying that my cousins live in an extremely old Victorian terrace house with a a large cellar and three floors above that and there are three cousins that live there the oldest Jade, middle child Laura, and the youngest by about 10 years, Theo. When all three of them live there, there always seemed to be something unusual happening. The two bedrooms on the top floor, basically in the attic, belonged to the two older girls who were teenagers, while Theo had a small bedroom on the middle floor next to his parents' room when he was little. Some of the more tame things that went on included books flying off shelves in the cellar and CDs doing the same out of the cabinet in the living room, but... As the girls got older, things became just even more strange. My aunt and cousins would fill me and my brother in whenever we saw them, and as an older kid or young teen, I was honestly excited, if not a little spooked, to see it. For example, Jade allowed Theo, which he was only a toddler, to sleep over with her in her room on the top floor one night, and she woke up to hear him talking. When she asked why he was talking, he said that he was talking to the little boy over there. This boy appeared a number of times, for example when he was up in Jade's room playing by himself and my uncle heard him laughing and went up, only for Theo to point out that he was playing and laughing with a little boy. Things did happen to Laura too, but not as much. I think the only time she ever experienced anything was when she was in her late teens, came home drunk, took a selfie in her dark room at night before she fell asleep, only to look at it in the morning and see that there was something that resembled a face in the picture. I've seen the picture myself and even though it could technically be something else, there's definitely something in the background and it's pretty creepy. Also, one of Laura's friends once claimed to have seen something when sleeping over. That being said though, most of the things did happen to poor Jade and Theo. And there are only two main other things that I can think of that happen to be the most scary too. 
One of them was when Theo was getting his hair cut by his dad in the cellar, which by the way the family dog refused to go down into for some reason, and asked my uncle, who's that man behind you? My uncle looked but apparently saw nothing. One of the other big things was when Jade and Theo were playing in the hallway on the middle floor and they both said that they saw something, a light or a shadow or something, they're not quite sure, come past them after coming from the top floor staircase. Immediately, Theo started crying because he was actually scared this time. All of this seemed to be centered around Jane though, and funnily enough, when she moved out and went to university, everything just stopped. And I mean everything. She hasn't lived in that house since, and there's not been a single incident. Of course, me and my brother conducted multiple ghost hunts in the cellar and the attic when we were kids, but we never found anything. The only reason why I thought of this story today is because, well, I was actually speaking to Theo, who was now 13. After both his sisters moved out, he moved into Jade's bedroom a few years ago because it was the biggest. However, now that he's moved back down to the middle floor to his old small bedroom, apparently because the wind was too loud up there or something, but according to his parents, they think he was a little creeped out by it. I mean, I think I would be too. I just hope this isn't the start of another round of whatever was wrong with that house, even though it made for some pretty interesting stories, I must admit. Even when we go around these days, I always find myself being extra speedy whenever I have to go upstairs to use the bathroom. All in all, I'm just glad nothing happened on the few occasions I used to sleep over there myself, but it was always interesting but creepy hearing the stories. So, I never believed in paranormal activity, and my brother had never believed either. But then, he moved into my dad's for a few years after college. And one night, him and I were at the bar drinking, and he looked at me and said, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm pretty sure dad's house is haunted. When he's out of town, I hear people talking around upstairs. I've woken up in bed hearing loud noises that get louder and louder, like they're coming at me, and I can't move until the noise stops. To be honest, I pretty much laughed it off and chalked it up to just night paralysis since I experience it myself sometimes and they're always accompanied by visual and audio hallucinations. Fast forward five to six years and my dad asks me to house sit since he's going to be gone for two weeks and it was going to be a vacation for my roommates for me so I accept. I stay in my brother's old room since it got converted to the guest room. First four or five days go by and nothing weird happens. But then it rained one night and I woke up and go upstairs and the light by the landing for the door and the kitchen light are both on. I chalk it up to just being drunk the night before and just not turning them off. But that night I'm in the basement playing some games and I go upstairs to get a drink, come back down and I notice that a closet door was open that I didn't remember being opened. Again, I attributed it to just being cracked open and when I opened the front door to check the mail, it was pulled open from suction, so I just shut it and made sure it was completely shut this time. Another couple of days go by with nothing and then I'm laying in bed about to go to sleep when it sounds like someone was walking around above me. I figure it's just the house settling, but I keep hearing it and it isn't the house settling and... It's definitely very distinct noises heading in a direction, stopping and then heading back or in another direction. After a while, I pretty much accept that I think someone must have broken in, so I yelled up and every time I did that I was calling the police, it would stop moving, but then it would start back up again. I obviously hadn't called the cops because, well, I remember what my brother had said and the fact that it would only temporarily stop when I yelled up was weird. At this point, I decided to grab a baseball bat and I headed upstairs, just in case. I turned on the light and kept talking to the intruder. I searched every inch of the upstairs, and the way it's set up, there's no real way to go from room to room unnoticed. No hallways upstairs, just three rooms, two of which have wide openings to each other, then a bathroom and a bedroom in the corner. I searched for about an hour and then went back downstairs and shut off all the lights because I couldn't find anything, and... About 10 minutes later, it started up again, and this time, it lasted about 30 minutes. And that night, I didn't get any sleep. A few more days go by with nothing, and then one night, I was in bed again, and I hear this 
really weird faint 8-bit sounding music and it just starts slowly getting louder and louder and at this point I'm in full panic mode because of what my brother had said but unlike him I, I don't have paralysis so I jump out of bed, grab my pillow and blanket and go out to the couch in the living room. I didn't hear the sound once I left the room and I stayed up watching the TV for a bit before falling asleep on the couch. It rained again that night and when I woke up, the closet that was open before was wide open again and the light above the front door landing was on again. Now, I was definitely sober that night and I know that I hadn't opened the closet since there was no need for me to go into it and I know for a fact that that light was off because if it's on when you're watching TV in the basement, it just kind of blinds you. And after that, I, I just stayed on the couch. And no more instances besides one other night when it rained and the light was on again. When my dad came back, I asked him if he ever experienced anything weird in the house and he said that he never had. I told him my story and then he said he's always thought that there might be something because no matter what time of year there's always a fly or two in his house and never any other type of bugs which was a bit odd to him but a couple of weeks after he came back he called me after a rainstorm to say that the light above the landing was on when he woke up and since then he said that the only times that it happens is when it rains and my brother or i had been at his house that week I'm still not 100% a believer by any means, but that being said, I, I still get goosebumps every time I tell anyone about this, including typing this out. I must admit, though, that I'm a lot more open these days to believe weird things that people tell me that just seem unbelievable. So, the weirdest thing has happened to me, and honestly, I, I don't know what I saw. It's around 4.30am here and all the dogs in my neighborhood are just freaking out. I get up to go let my dogs inside the house figuring that that'll at least calm things down a bit and I open the back porch door and look to my right where there's a fence line to another house and I looked over there because it looked like there were clothes hanging off the fence and our neighbors have never done that so I thought it was weird but then I, I saw them. There were two men in black suits but I swear to you that... They didn't have any head. I look at them for a good minute to make sure my eyes just aren't playing tricks on me and they don't move and they just kind of stand there. And I mean, they were completely still, almost as if they were in still frame or something. I could tell that one looked heavier than the other, but that was it. And well, I, I just backed into the house and locked the back door and turned off the light. I go back into my room and my husband is now awake because of all the dogs barking and I tell him that I'm going to wait until it's light outside to get the dogs in because I just saw something that I cannot explain. I told him what I saw and I said that I feel like I sound crazy but I know that I saw it. He seemed like he believed me but I don't know. I know it all sounds crazy but I swear to you I saw them. This story starts around seven years ago when I was a senior in high school. I joined the cross country team in my senior year and I really loved the experience and the team camaraderie. The boys and girls teams trained together in the A groups and B groups. The A group was pretty much all boys and me and I didn't mind this. It definitely pushed me to be a better runner but it was really difficult to try and keep up with them, I must admit. Being in the A group, I grew close with a lot of the guys and they all knew that I had a boyfriend. One guy, Joe, was really funny and we got along great. We'd sit next to each other on the bus, do meets and we'd text a lot but I thought that we were just friends. After cross country ended, the boys convinced me to do indoor track. And this is where Joe just got weird. In January, my relationship ended and it was whatever. I mean, a high school relationship ending isn't the end of the world, right? But Joe started acting just strangely towards me. He got really mad if I didn't text him back. I went to a house party and drank and he sent me this long text about how he was so disappointed in me and he thought that I was better than that. Our friendship started to get emotionally abusive. Joe kept on mentioning how I made him feel worthless and he said things like, I bet you wouldn't even care if I died and he got jealous all the time and became just so controlling. 
I was already under school stress, so I decided to take a break from Joe. He didn't like this, obviously, and Joe started spreading rumors around school that I was hooking up with guys that had girlfriends, that I did sexually explicit things for weed, and just really awful things. Luckily, most people didn't believe him, but by the time Outdoor Track came around, our friendship was just completely over. I was really happy because the girls' and boys' track teams were two separate things, and girls' distance had their own coach and their own practices and whatnot. So, I saw Joe, but I never had to train or practice with him. He stopped calling and texting me, and that was a relief too, I must admit, but after track season ended and I was about to graduate, Joe sent me a, just a, a really long apology. He said that he didn't know he had feelings for me until my boyfriend and I broke up. He said that that's what triggered his weird behavior and he was sorry for ruining our friendship. I accepted his apology and went on with my life and we texted from time to time but we absolutely were not close friends anymore. But it was the summer after my senior year that Joe started to make me really nervous. At least once a week at 1 and 2 in the morning, a car would drive down our street just blasting its horn. It became such an issue that the whole neighborhood was on watch for the mystery horn blaster. I started getting texts from Joe some nights saying things like, come out. I'd reply the next morning with just a question mark and he'd say that he was drunk and just drunk texted. Now, I worked over the summer so I was usually in bed by like 9 or 10ish, but one night I was up a little late. When I turned off my lights in my room, I immediately got a text from Joe that said, good night. This freaked me out a bit and I told my parents everything that had happened and they were obviously concerned too. My dad immediately thought Joe was the mystery honker and I sent Joe a non-threatening text just saying that I worked long days so I'm normally in bed early so I'd appreciate not getting texted so late. I still got sporadic texts from Joe but the mystery honking stopped which was honestly great. In the fall I actually went away to college. One weekend I came home and was up in my room and I got a text from Joe at around midnight saying welcome home. I freaked out and looked outside, but I didn't see a car. I asked how he knew I was home, and he said lots of people were home for the weekend, so he just assumed I was too. Joe then proceeded to favorite all of my tweets, around 2,000, mind you, and like all of my Instagram posts. I'd had enough at this point and blocked him literally everywhere, and I texted all of my friends and told them what happened, and to not mention me to Joe at all, because he definitely was obsessed with me. Joe then called me and told me that he was going to end himself. I told my parents everything and my dad got the police involved and I didn't hear from Joe after this until two summers later. It's important to note too that around this time one of my brothers moved out. My mum wanted to turn my room into an office so I moved rooms upstairs to his old room. My room now faced the back part of the house and not the street anymore. My dad works in the courts and occasionally he has to do bail duty where if someone gets arrested he's the person that has to post bail. It really sucks because he can get a call at like 2 in the morning and have to go bail someone out. Now on one particular night my dad got a bail call at 2. He went downstairs and got water and saw the motion light in the backyard was on. Which was weird. So he looked out of the kitchen window and saw a guy in our backyard looking up at my room. He ran outside and the guy jumped the fence and the police came and took statements but it was in the middle of the night and my dad was pretty tired so it could have been Joe but the police couldn't prove it. And the next few months I, I just felt on edge. I felt really unsafe in my own house and I mean how did Joe know that I moved rooms? How long would he watch me? It was nauseating and my parents saw the toll that this was taking on me physically and emotionally. I was snapping at them over small things and my hair was actually beginning to fall out and I was losing weight. One day at breakfast my dad walked into the kitchen and said, I'm handling this Joe situation today, he won't bother you anymore. And after that, the incidents just stopped. Funnily enough too, a few years later, I actually ran into Joe at a party and he saw me and just turned white and left the party immediately. I have absolutely no clue what my dad did, but he made sure Joe never came around again. When I was younger, 
we would stay at my aunt's house when my family visited my mum's hometown. They had a lab and we only ever had a a hypoallergenic dog and I got a rash from it and oddly it spread, well, down there if you know what I mean. My mum says its cause was I was a kid and I probably wasn't washing my hands and then going to the bathroom with whatever I was allergic to still on my hands. Dog hair I guess or perhaps dandruff, I don't know. By the way, my mum took me to the dermatologist right when I got home because it had not gone away. Neither of my parents used a dermatologist, so they asked friends for a recommendation. My mum is a doctor, so she did look into this guy before she took me to him, and he had a good reputation. When we met with him, and I do remember parts of this, he checked over everything and said it wasn't much to be worried about and gave me a steroid for it. He then asked my mum if he would be able to take a picture of the rash to document it for his research. Now, my mum being a doctor is pretty okay with using cases for research and whatnot. I know this because I'm used for a research study since I had certain hip surgery at such a young age, but she felt like this was just off. She said that she really didn't think of him asking in any sort of creepy way, but she said that regardless if there was a rare case to be documented, she would never let a doctor take pictures of her four-year-old daughter's private parts. But she said that the biggest red flag was that he had just said it's a, a common thing and not to worry about it. My mum being in medicine knows that this means there's an extensive research on it and a picture of a common rash did not make sense. Well, she forgot about it and obviously didn't take me back. She told her friends that recommended him about it, but we all kind of just forgot about it. That was until we saw him on the news. He was arrested at the American and Canadian border and was found in possession of more than 200 pictures and videos of child porn. So, thank you mum for not always putting your trust in doctors, or people who we should put our trust in. This happened a couple of years ago. I wanted to go to the local wildlife trail to walk in the woods. I had gone several times to hike and jog, and I normally went with my boyfriend at the time, but he was working when I wanted to go. So I decided to go myself and I felt pretty comfortable going. I parked at the far end of the parking lot in case anyone else showed up. The trail continues straight from the parking lot for about a mile until it curves up a large hill. Where I wanted to go was the abandoned parking lot with the lake. The turn off this part of the trail was about 400 yards down the trail on the left I think. But once you turn left you have about 200 yards of flat trail before it inclines. The inclined section is loose gravel and it's quite noisy when you're walking up it, but this section lasts for about 100 yards. So I felt pretty at ease going along the straight trail before I turned left. When I hit the incline I just began to feel uneasy. I brushed it off as just being overly paranoid though and continued. As I was about halfway up the incline I began to hear crunching and snapping of trees in the woods to my right. It sounded about a hundred yards off to my right and it was just far enough in the woods that I couldn't see what was making the noise. I froze in my tracks and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I stood still there as I heard the crunching stop and uh, stupidly, I know, I I brushed it off as a deer or a bobcat. Uh, The crunching was too loud to be a raccoon or a squirrel. So I continued up the path until I hit the end of the incline. That's when I heard the thing in the woods begin to run at me and I was frozen in fear and my heart was beating a million miles an hour and every hair in my body was standing straight up but I was just rooted in place and that's when I saw him. A man was running straight for me while holding something in his right hand. I began to run down the incline back to the main trail and I was slipping and sliding down the gravel and I looked behind me and he was now at the top of the incline and he had this evil look in his eyes. I noticed the item in his hand was a knife, I think, and I almost slipped due to me looking back at the man and he called out to me, get back here. His tone was malicious and I just sprinted as fast as I could and took a hard right back onto the main path. When I hit the parking lot, I I didn't look back and I unlocked my car and just started it as quickly as I could and right as I was backing up, he emerges from the trail entrance and he just stands there, partially covered in the shade of the trees. As I tear through the parking lot and onto the highway, he just stares at me and 
biggest creepiest smile comes across his face and he slowly waves at me as I'm getting onto the highway. And well, needless to say, I, I never went back to that trail. That encounter has scared me for life when it comes to hiking in the woods. Oh, and uh, by the way, no, I didn't call the police or file a report. Yes, that was a very stupid thing to do, I know, but I couldn't call the police after it happened because I didn't have a cell phone. The nearest police station was about 45 minutes away, so by the time I arrived there, the man would have been long gone. But looking back at it, I, I know I should have still reported it, but I was a shaken up teen that honestly didn't know what to do. My wife and I had just moved into a new apartment on the top floor of our four-story complex. I think it used to be an office space or something because the layout was just a, a little bit odd. It was a big U-shape with a large bedroom on the inside of the U, with the other rooms and the kitchen space on the outside. It was really big, but I guess the layout made it a hard sell because we got a pretty nice price for it. But both ends of the U-shape had doors on them that opened to the hallway outside of our apartment. The bedroom in the middle also had two doors that opened to the legs of the U-shape and if you opened both of them, you could see straight through the bedroom. Like I said, it was a weird layout but it's kind of novel. So I moved in first because I worked from home at the time and needed my work computer set up ASAP. I spent the first night alone there while my wife stayed at our previous place with the bulk of our stuff. This place had a buzzer that opened the front door and our apartment had an intercom with three buttons but they weren't labelled. Night falls and I'm chilling in the new place, mostly watching stuff on my iPad and wondering how we're going to use the space when I hear the intercom beep. I walk over to it and wait a moment because I'm honestly not sure how it works and it beeps again. I hold down the first button and I hear the speaker turn on but it's just dead air. I ask who's there and get no response and I kind of hear that someone's there though but they just aren't saying anything. I ask again who it is and still nothing. I figure that maybe I need to hold in the second button to talk to them so I hold it in and ask again and still nothing. After a few seconds though I, I hear a door open and close and then there's real silence like nobody's there. I'm a little unsettled by this so I call my wife to ask if she's trying to get in. She picks up and she says that she's at home and I tell her about the intercom and she says that the first button is to listen, the third button is to talk, and the middle button buzzes them into the building. And at that moment, I'm standing by one of the front doors and I hear someone slam open the stairwell door just outside of it. Just a moment later, someone tests the handle on my front door. Luckily it's locked and deadbolted, but in a moment of panic I realize that the other door is unlocked and I hear the person in the hallway walking towards it. I sprint through the bedroom to the other door and reach it at the same time as the person outside does and I slam my full weight into it like Dr. Grant on Jurassic Park and spin the deadbolt closed. They test the handle but then they go back to the stairwell. My wife is still on the phone during this and is freaking out because she's just heard me run and tackle a door to keep it closed and I'm explaining to her what happened and as I'm doing it, the intercom beeps again. I freeze and just a moment later, it beeps again. This time, I hold in the listen button and again it's the dead air like before, but you can tell that someone's there. After a few seconds, I hear the building's outer door open and close and they're gone. I asked the building manager about it, but he said that he didn't see anything on the cameras for the time I mentioned. Nobody. This happened to my parents before I was born. Back then they lived in a small rented house and were quite poor and my dad studied and went from job to job and my mum worked as a teacher. They also helped themselves a bit by selling bread which my dad baked in the house's kitchen. Now my dad's pretty skeptical and even he felt uneasy there. They would always see doors closing and they'd hear steps or what sounded like a woman crying in empty rooms and also, the kitchen, which was very small and only had a little window, was just always cold. Even when baking the bread, my dad had to wear a sweater, which is really strange since we lived in a tropical country. 
But my mum, on the other hand, has always been a firm believer in the supernatural and also very scared of it. They both think, though, that that's why this all hit her the hardest. She's always had trouble sleeping and constant nightmares, but the last straw was one day they got up in the morning and my mum was pale like he'd never seen her. In his words, she looked like a corpse. By next week, they were living with my grandma and only took a few personal belongings with them, clothes and stuff like that. They remember that moving was a, a bit comical because they asked a priest's advice beforehand and he told them that they should swear aggressively while stating that this stuff was theirs and they wanted no one accompanying them where they were going. And fortunately for them, nothing as aggressive has happened to them since then. We lived in a few homes growing up where we had paranormal experiences. I wouldn't say it was that we had bad luck necessarily. I, I think it was more of a, a gift or something, but depending on how you perceived it. This was one of the most frightening experiences my siblings and some friends had while I'm alone though. So at 15, I was the second oldest of four kids. My parents separated right after my 13th birthday. Among the many changes was our new home too, and we had just rented it but were unaware of its own complicated history. The owner had apparently been electrocuted and died while working on the roof attempting repairs. His wife had not mentioned this when we first moved into the home, and oftentimes the lights would just flicker or go out entirely while one of us were in the middle of showering. But this almost exclusively always happened in the master bathroom and bedroom, his part of the house. Just as you would get out of the shower to yell for someone to check the fuse box, they would just go back on. You'd return to shower and then it would go off again. It was kind of like a, a scary game that only the other party enjoyed playing. The house seemed to prefer the darkness and eventually the kids just stopped using the bathroom in that room altogether. But one night I was home babysitting my sister and brother. They must have been 13 and 11 respectively. My boyfriend had brought his best friend over to keep us all company and kind of hang out. Even he knew that it was always more frightening to be in the house alone at night. So we sat in the living room watching television and snacking and from our seated positions the television was off to the left and the dining area to the right. Hallways are both directly behind and in front of us that would lead off to different parts of the home. And as we talked and teased each other I began to hear noises off to the right coming from the kitchen. At first, it was easy to convince myself that I was hearing things. Every time I would look up at the sound, there was nothing, but it wasn't long before the noises became just more frequent and louder. Undeniable, in fact. At first, there was creaking tiles as if someone had turned the corner into the kitchen. Of course, nobody was there. But then, plates started shifting in the dryer and on the countertop. Then, the creaking of the cupboards and the pantry door as they slowly and methodically opened. But nobody was speaking anymore and all of us were nervously looking around trying to communicate with one another without saying anything. Shaking my head at my boyfriend, I was asking him to not address the sounds and obvious fear we all felt. I didn't want my brother and sister upset and it was already close to 10 at night and where would we even go to? I remember raising the volume of the movie, hoping to drown out the noise, when from my peripheral vision, I saw a black shadow. A figure walked the length of the room in front of us. It was something of a den that opened into the back end to the master bedroom and bath. Again, his part of the house. The front part entered into a room that opened into the living room where we sat now, and directly looking up, I didn't initially see anything, so I just prayed silently that it was just my imagination. But again, a dark shadow figure walked the length of the room. Looking up, there was nothing there, but... Another time, quicker now, a, a more hurried pace, three, four, five times now, and then the figure was no longer in my peripheral vision. It was outright stalking back and forth in the length of the room. But not only was it darker now, but it was much larger too, taller. It seemed to encompass so much more space than a few minutes ago, and our unwillingness to acknowledge its presence had seemingly angered it or something. It loomed larger as it stomped back and forth faster and faster, and after each turn it seemed to whip around. I looked at my brother and sister and saw that they too were clearly aware of this presence. And my friend saw it also, and everyone was just seemingly frozen. And nobody spoke or even moved a muscle. 
The shadow also now seemed to be in a rage and it had taken on a darkness that just permeated the room. It had grown so large that the top of its head was no longer visible. It let out noises that sounded like heavy breathing and grunts and suddenly the kitchen just erupted in a cacophony of sounds. Every cupboard began to slam open and shut. Dishes shook so loud that I was sure that they were being broken. The back door was violently struggling against its lock. The doorknob twisting and turning as unseen hands tried to open it. Simultaneously, everyone was up at this point and out of their seats in an instant. The explosion of sounds from the kitchen had prompted action on all of our parts and we just hit the front door screaming and yelling. Pulling at it though, we initially couldn't get it to budge. My younger sister had actually been trampled in everyone's hurry to escape and when the door finally was opened, she was still on the floor crying. My boyfriend ran in just enough to drag her out by her arms and we ran into the darkness several blocks to a friend's house where we all tried our best to explain what had just happened. Luckily for us, my mum believed us because she admitted she'd had experiences of her own and they were just unexplainable. We lasted just a year in that home and as far as we know, it still sits unoccupied. Families just moving in and out and never staying very long. To this day, it all just seems so unreal. I'm from the northeast Pennsylvania area where nothing too exciting usually happens. When I was in high school, or more specifically the 11th grade in 2014, there was a man who shot two police officers and killed one. After he did this, there was a search for him all around Pennsylvania and the states around and he was on America's Most Wanted. I'm sure if you do some research you can find his name, but anyway... Police around our area were sure that he was in the woods somewhere, so they made it clear for everyone not to be out too late and to lock your doors at night. But one night, my friend and I were driving around our area late at night, especially because, like I said, there was nothing to do in our area, and we got to a main road and my friend starts to slow down. I was on my phone scrolling through my music playlist to pick what song to play next. I looked over to her when she slowed down and I noticed she was on her phone quickly. Since it was late at night, there was not a single person on the road, so she decided to go about 5 miles per hour and just answer someone quick. But we continued going slowly and on our phones until something told us to both look up. At the same time, we looked up and we see a man in total black from head to toe walking on the yellow lines in the middle of the road. We didn't think anything of it, to be honest, until he walked towards our car fast enough to catch up. We sat in silence until the man, who just looked like a black figure at this point, reached for my friend's driver's door handle. We both screamed at the top of our lungs and my friend pressed on the gas and we didn't slow down or stop until we reached the next town. A couple of weeks later and the man was found right in that area where we were. We don't know if it was actually him but we have a fairly good idea that it definitely could have been. So, I probably don't need some sort of long-winded introduction to instill this one simple fact. Being in the woods alone can be creepy as hell. So one early afternoon, I was driving home from a friend's and passed by a secluded little park. I knew the park had a few hiking trails that led to this massive cliffside overlooking a valley and a forest. The photos I'd seen of the view were just totally breathtaking, so I decided I need to check it out for myself. It was an absolutely beautiful summer day and early enough in the afternoon that I figured I wouldn't scare myself at the small sounds of nature. I pulled into the empty parking lot, parked my car, checked the map and started along the widest path. It was the easiest looking path that consisted of climbing over a few rocks and some small hills and it was also the most clear of the paths with few curves and little brush. About halfway through I came upon a small hill that led down to a large clearing. As I came up to the top of the hill, I saw a little old man with white hair sitting on the rocks at the bottom of the hill. I walked down and I smiled at him. Where are you heading? He asked with a smile and a pleasant tone. I told him that I was trying to get to the cliffs and his demeanor just quickly changed. He said, you should be careful. I figured that he was just trying to be helpful as I was five foot tall, a teenage girl and the cliffs were very high and overlooked an incredibly steep valley. I smiled, thanked him and began to continue walking. 
and then, with an incredibly blank stare and flat tone, he insisted, no, you really need to be careful. It no longer seemed like a friendly warning, and I explained I hiked a lot and was confident in my ability to handle the cliffs, and thanked him again for his concern. But then he said, a lot of teenagers come out here to look at the cliffs, and he pauses, and a lot of them never come back. I nervously laugh at this. I mean, he has to be kidding, right? But then he says, it's almost as if someone is pushing them off. And the look in his eyes and the tone of his voice just sent a chill down my spine and told me that this wasn't a joke. In fact, it kind of sounded like a threat. Being that I'm very paranoid, specifically in the woods, I figured I was just being dramatic and... I thanked him one last time and continued heading down into the direction of the cliffs. He remained silent and I only made it a few steps away from the clearing when I realized that I could just not shake this feeling. The old man had freaked me out way too much for me to continue on and enjoy myself. So I turned back around towards the clearing and realized that he was no longer there. I hadn't heard him move and I couldn't see him in the very clear path ahead of me. Only a few seconds had passed since we parted ways, too. Well, I hastily set off the way that I'd come and, intently listening for any sound surrounding me, I made it safely to the empty parking lot with no issues, and that's when I realized that the parking lot had been empty this entire time, even when I first arrived. So, where did this man come from, and where did he go? I jumped in my car and threw it into drive and sped all the way home. But nothing ever happened and my tires weren't slashed, I didn't see eyes peering out from the forest as I drove away or anything and I never saw the man again and I sadly never went back to see the cliffs either. But I could just never shake this feeling that I got in those woods. Maybe he was just a friendly old man worried for my well-being, maybe he was my guardian angel saving me from a clumsy fall or maybe he was planning to maliciously throw me off the cliff or something. I guess I... They never know. This was the first and only time that I ever used my emergency code word with my mum. My dad was in a band and some of his band members were in a country band that had a performance on 4th of July. It was taking place on a ranch type area near a highway and when I got there I quickly realised that everyone there was either 20 years older than me or 10 years younger. I was 17 at the time and so I realized that I most likely was going to be there bored for three hours. But one of the band members' wives brought over a girl who looked to be my age though. She introduced her to me and treated her like a friend. The girl, who we'll call Sarah, started talking with me and asked if I would like to go for a walk around the field. I agreed and so we set off. We started talking about school and it turns out that she was a year younger than me and she was homeschooled. I told her that I went to an old girls Catholic school and she started talking about how she thought most girls were pretty narky and nasty and that she practiced witchcraft. I thought it was kind of weird but I tried to be open minded so I wasn't trying to judge her. We finally got to the side of the field that couldn't be seen by the people at the event but was right next to the highway and there we came across the body of a, a dead deer. She looked at me and said I really wish I could take its hoof. I wonder if I have any bags on me. I thought that she was joking, but she reached into her backpack and pulled out a knife and a brown paper bag. She went over to the dead deer and started sawing at its foot, but she couldn't get all the way through, so she tried to get me to help her, but I said no. So she put down the knife and ripped the hoof off with her bare hands, and at this point... I was honestly freaking out because she had just been talking about how she liked violence and didn't really care about people being hurt. She grabbed the hoof and put it in the bag and then put it in her backpack. She was still carrying the knife and I tried texting my mum but there was no service where we were standing. We kept walking and she was talking about how she would put curses on people that she didn't like and how she was completely desensitized to death and the killing of animals because she had grown up on a farm where she watched her mother cut the heads off of rabbits. We kept walking and came across a fork in the road and she said that we should go one way. And then 
she told me that she wasn't going to chop me into pieces or anything because that doesn't happen much these days. We finally got to the place where there was cell service and I texted my mum our code word. She told me to get back to the barbecue and we would leave right away. Sarah asked me if I had to leave and I told her that whenever my grandma got to her house that we would have to go home and meet her. I mentioned something about her bringing her dog named Buddy and Sarah got excited about the name. She said that she had a dog named Buddy who she set free in the wild and he was eaten alive by coyotes. But it was okay because he died happy or something. But we finally got back to where everyone was and my mum said that we needed to get back home. Sarah then asked for my phone number as she had seen my phone and I agreed and put in a fake number before my parents and I walked away. As soon as we were out of eyesight I ran to the car and my parents got in the car and asked me if she had pulled out drugs or something. And boy, I wish that would have been the case because I would have known at least how to handle that. Ever since I was 14 years old, I've been scared of lightning. It started when I was out in a soccer field during a thunderstorm and lightning struck the fence, just over 100 feet away from me. But the sound was just deafening and I can still remember the awful sensation of the sound vibrating through my whole body. But this wouldn't be my only incident involving a lightning strike that I came too close to. And the next time, it wouldn't only scare me, it would also be my salvation. So when I turned 20, I moved out from my parents who live in the capital of my country to a small community in the south and I have no intention of moving back. Sure, uh, a girl that grew up in the city is used to the endless variations of restaurants and bars and stores that never close and a city that never sleeps, but to be honest, I really like it here. Despite the low population of the community and something of a sleepy town stamp on it, it's charming with its colourful wooden houses, the seaside campus and the smell of butter from the old butter factory is an eternal reminder of where you are. I can practically go out whenever I want and wherever I want and meet a total of 10 people, the neighbourhood cat and, if I'm lucky, a cute but lost hedgehog. There is one more reason though why I appreciate living in a small town and it's how incredibly safe I feel here. In the city, you can barely be outside alone as a woman after 10pm without feeling just such discomfort that you feel compelled to check behind you once or twice every minute. All such discomfort, however, doesn't only happen after said time or during the darkest hours of the day. It can happen any time, but that is something that you learn and something that I had to learn. So I was 17 and it was the summer holidays. I was spending most of my time at my then boyfriend's house and he lived with his family about 20 minutes outside of the city. I lived with my parents at the time in the city centre, just along the green subway line, so if I wanted to get back home I had to take the commuter train to the central station, walk across it and switch to the green subway line and ride a few minutes on there to get to my station. I was then in one of my rebellious periods and had a month of bleaching my hair and I loved it at first but after a while my roots started to show and I realised my mistake. My angel of a mother had tired of my fuss over it and booked me at the hairdresser so that I could go back to my natural deep brown hair colour. The day for my appointment at the hairdresser came and I was as usual at my boyfriend's but I needed something for my parents apartment first so I put on my headphones and jumped on the commuter train. I switched as usual to the green line and sat near one of the doors that I knew would line up perfectly to where I would get off. I also like to crowd watch people when I travel. Not to stare people out or anything like that, but just to look at people and think about where they're going and what they do for work or maybe make up a, a story about them or something. It's a kind of game that I often find myself playing on the subway or commuter train when I'm bored. And I played that game that day. I looked around at the people and when there was one station left until my stop, my eyes stuck to a man who was sitting a few feet in front of me. He was tall, perhaps in his mid-thirties. His hair was dark and scruffy, wearing dark clothes and big boots. He sat with his elbows leaning against his knees, scratching slightly down towards the subway floor. But today, I, I don't remember what my analysis or fictional story was of him, but I know that I saw him. The woman in the speakers shouted out my destination, and I stood up, and I went to the doors and stepped off. When I got out of the doors of the station, I saw that it had started to rain, so I pulled my big hood over the headphones and started to quickly walk up to the apartment, which was only a few hundred feet from the station. 
The apartment is an old building with a large wooden door facing the street. The door has a glass pane that runs along the entire door and when you enter the staircase is entirely in marble with an old wooden elevator with an iron lattice door that you have to close manually. When I got into the door I put in the entry code and I pushed up the door. When the door was swung aside something was reflected in the glass and I turned around and saw the man from the subway standing behind me. At first I was a little shocked that he was so close to me but I assumed that he was one of my neighbours or a neighbour's friend. I also assumed that he stood so close to me because it rained and he didn't want to get wet so I said hello and pressed up the door an extra time with my hip while I took off my headphones. But he didn't answer. I went to the lift and pressed the button but I heard that it didn't start so I assumed that the neighbours had opened the lattice door to park the elevator at their floor while they locked their door or something. I turned around and I saw the man standing behind me shaking. Now it wasn't a type of typical shaking that's common if you get a fever or a cold but more like a, a spastic twitching or something. He stood there jerking with his head and back as curved as he had on the subway but this time his eyes were not on the floor, they were on me. He opened his mouth to talk but only incoherent sounds came out while the shaking and the jerking became just more frantic. What's your name? he said at last and I remember my parents word of wisdom to never tell your name to a stranger, especially one whom one feels threatened by. I wanted to tell him to go but I felt like I was frozen and provoking him might make the situation worse so I replied with a false name and then he asked, do you live here? I lied and answered that I don't, that I'm just here to see a friend. I remember thinking that I was smart because now he didn't know my name or where I lived I thought but it was at this point he started to move closer to me. I started backing up and he must have seen the fear in my eyes but he continued, scuffling towards me. I heard the elevator engine start ticking and that it was on its way down. He told me that he's been following me on the train and that he saw me there and that he had just followed me. And it was now that he lifted his head from his previous position, showing how tall he really was and the shaking stopped. And he spoke again. He said, you're the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. And if I thought I was frozen before, that was an understatement. I was now pressed against the elevator door and he was so close that I could feel his scent. Now, some may think that these words still may have been somewhat flattering, but the way he said it, it sounded like a, a death sentence almost. Like something bad. Bad for me. It was about then that I heard the elevator stop on the first floor and someone walked down the stairs to the courtyard door. That door is located on a small platform between the ground floor and the first floor stairs. You also know how you can recognize and distinguish your parents' steps from others. I did this with these steps that came down the stairs and I heard that they were my father's. I quickly thought that I would scream for him but then I realized that the man would know that I lied then and that he might get angry and do something to my old father. And that was when my father opened the door to the courtyard and the lightning struck the yard. The sound waves of the cracking lightning pressed itself through the open door and made the whole marble stairwell scream. And at that point, I screamed and the man screamed. I went to my usual position regarding the thunder and the lightning fetal position on the floor. He, on the other hand, jumped backwards and started running out, while he shouted that we'll be seeing each other again soon. I barely realized what had happened and I went crying up the elevator and into the apartment where I told everything to my mother and also father when he came up from the courtyard. We reported the incident to the police and I went and dyed my hair which made me feel a little safer as my appearance changed quite drastically. I was still a little scared after the incident but also confused. I just kept thinking about what he was saying when he ran out. It will be seeing each other again soon. I knew at least that I absolutely did not want to see him again but unfortunately I didn't get what I wanted. About a month passed and I had practically forgotten about the situation. I was on my way to the central station to meet up with my boyfriend who was on the commuter train on his way to me and I stood and waited for him in the hallway between the commuter trains and the subway. In that particular hallway a lot of people are walking either to the trains or from the trains. Very few people are standing still in it. As I said I stood there, looked down the hallway from time to time to try and see if my boyfriend had come yet when I see someone else standing still. 
There was someone standing on the other side of the crowd, and although everyone goes in different directions and creates a kind of a, a blurred effect on him, I, I could definitely see who it was. And I freeze just like before. He stares at me, not like our first meeting though, but as if he's trying to make up if I am who he thinks I am, but behind the dark hair that is. And then, my boyfriend comes from the crowd and hugs me, and I have to look away from the man a few seconds to hug him back, and I leaned my head against his shoulder and looked over to see if the man was still there, but then he was gone. And after that, I, I haven't seen him since. But my question is, has he seen me? My parents were with friends on a night out and my sister was with them. I was home alone and just laying in bed. My family has had a history of hauntings and just weird activity, but for the longest time I was so invested in the paranormal, I myself got scratches and started getting affected. I told myself that maybe if I stop being so into the paranormal stuff that I'll be left alone. Now, at around 10.30pm, I was laying in bed and everything was quiet. But this morning, my neighbor was asking my father why they were screaming and banging doors and stairs very loudly. My dad was like, what? I wasn't even at home. So we asked another neighbor and they said the same. They apparently heard my mother and sister and father shouting and they woke up and were actually contemplating calling the police due to how loud it was. Doors were literally slammed and stairs were pounded on extremely loudly. My car even stopped to bang on our wall to ask if everything was okay. But the crazy thing is that, besides the car stopping, I, I didn't hear anything. No screaming, no door slamming, no footsteps on stairs, no banging on the wall. I, I did hear the car drive away, but that was it. And I don't know how to explain this. Does anyone have any answers? So it was exactly midnight when I was sat in my bedroom watching TV when I heard a cough that sounded loud. Now, my bedroom is the window that you can actually see in the video that I'm about to show you, so I'm right next to the front door. Anyway, I hear this cough and it sounded like it was outside, but I didn't really bat an eyelid because my mum was in the room directly behind mine and she often coughs and I can hear her through the wall, so not uncommon. I leave it for five minutes and hear another cough again pretty loud, but again I ignored it. I heard my mum leave the room and come into mine. She asked me what I was looking for outside and I was really confused and said that I wasn't outside. She then brought up the three videos of this guy I just stood outside our house for a solid ten minutes. It's important to know at this point that I live down a long private road that backs onto a nature reserve so there's trees and bushes surrounding the entire house. So, the only way to get to my house is from the road. I live at the very bottom of this road, so he would have had to have passed another, like, 30 to 40 houses to get here. Anyway, we open the door to this guy still standing there, and the conversation goes as follows. Uh, can I help you? Uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to find my way out, and I thought I'd knock on your door because, well, I, I saw lights were on. Uh, okay, well, you definitely didn't knock because we would have heard it, so please don't lie to me. How did you get here in the first place? Uh, I'm just trying to find a way out, okay? This goes on for a while before we get annoyed because clearly he's making no effort to leave, so we told him to just get lost. Well, I'd like you to leave now, please. The guy starts to walk around our house and not towards the exit. No, the exit is over this way. I know the way out, alright? The guy then starts to make his way to our side gate. Remember I said that our house is surrounded by trees and bushes? Well, this gate hasn't been used for the last 17 years or so. It's overgrown like hell and you can't exactly see it unless you know it's there or climbing through the bushes for some reason. As he goes off that way, I head up our driveway and my house is lower down to the drive and I go and watch him. Just outside the side gate is our neighbor's house which has a little section of road that is only outside of their house so when they park cars there nobody minds because well it's out of the way. So when I head up to see if he's actually left, surprise surprise he's still here and now walking around our neighbor's car. 
it certainly doesn't seem like a person who wants to find his way out. So again, we tell him to leave and point him in the right direction. He heads off up the road all the while I'm hanging around to make sure he leaves, so I give it a minute and I look down the length of the road to where it splits into a T-junction. And I can't see him anywhere, but then he appears walking from right to left, stops in the light of the streetlight, and continues to just stare at me. I pretend to walk off at this point and come back a few seconds later. Again, he's not there, but after a few seconds, he's now walking from left to right and he sees me again and yells, you don't have to keep watching me. So, right now, he's walking back and forth along the top of my road. I hide again, give it a couple of minutes and walk up the road to see if he's still there, and nothing. I spend the next 30 minutes or so walking up and down my road to make sure he's gone and I can't find him so I don't know if he passed out in a bush or what, but that was the last time that I saw him. About two months ago, my best friend and I made plans to hang out. She's been my best friend for more than 10 years now and I'm a year older but she used to break down in crowded places and was bullied when we were in school together so I'm fiercely protective of her. Seriously, you mess with her and you mess with me. The state we live in has a high rate of human trafficking which makes me even more vigilant and particularly sensitive to this event. So our favourite mall is a great place to hang out on weekdays as it's not particularly crowded. That's the way we like it too. There's so much to do there that when we go, we usually pick a movie time and spend the time before it shopping and snacking and exploring. And we were there all day and she was pretty aloof that day. I, however, felt on edge and a bit unfriendly. I'm usually not like that, but I just chalked it up to just being a bit cranky after getting rained on. So my mum drilled it into me to always be aware of my surroundings and I've always been good at remembering names and faces so when we saw people in the mall more than once I usually remembered when I saw them, how many times I saw them and even where. But Bestie and I stopped at one of the shops to get smoothies and sat down at a table to take a rest. It's a big mall and we were walking all day so I welcomed the rest. While we were in line I saw a man cut through the shop and walk behind us. But the shop was a corner shop with open entryway, so when I say cut through, he walked between us and a pillar. And there was that on-edge feeling again. I became tense and immediately checked to make sure that I hadn't been pickpocketed or something. I had all my stuff though, so I just tried to relax. But we were waiting for our drinks to be made and I saw the man walk past us again, this time slower and around the pillar. There was nothing particularly scary about him. Average height, build, kind of a, a dad bod, jeans, dark button up, short haircut, but I immediately just wanted him to go away. I told Bestie that I would grab us a table and I sat where she and I could see one another while she waited for our drinks. I kept my eyes on her in case he came back as well. While she was getting our drinks, I saw the guy come back. And this time, not alone, but with two other men. They seemed similar in age, and all three were wearing jeans. One in a denim jacket and a hat, the other in a white shirt with gold chain on his neck, and the cologne they wore was just overwhelming. They kind of made me think of middle-aged men who go to clubs to hit on girls and whatnot. But my internal voice was just screaming, these guys are pimps or something. Bestie joined me at the table and we immediately started on our drinks and cookies that we bought at our favourite cookie shop. I relaxed a moment and while I was happily munching away, guess who comes around the corner again? I wait until they pass and then lean in and tell Bestie what's going on. Hey, uh, don't be alarmed but those guys keep walking by us. What guys? As she's asking, they come around the corner again. Them, over there. We both remain quiet until they pass, and, and now that we're together, they slow down when passing our table. This makes me think that either she's their intended target, or they just think now that we're together that we'll be distracted. I try not to alarm her, but I've seen some of these guys hanging out around other stores that we've been in that day. She watches them go, and it's a quiet moment, and my bestie says, uh, I don't overthink it, hey, maybe they're just more walkers. Me, unconvinced, say, eh, maybe. 
She tries to cheer me up by talking about the movie that we plan to see and now she's happy that we can get into dine in the theatre. I know that this is her way of trying to protect me by distracting me, but while she's double checking show times, all I think of is how my mum told me to use an umbrella as a weapon. I tried to smile and brush things off for both of our sakes, but while she's checking show times, guess who comes back around the corner? She's nose deep in her phone, so I turn my upper body towards them, scowling and make sure that I look at each of them in the eye as they walk by. I had my phone in my hands and got the sudden idea to hold it up like I was taking a picture or a video. The guys speed up a bit and White Shirt looked back at me as they went by. I watched until they were out of sight and we didn't see them again for the rest of the night. The mood improved and we had some fun but I broke down about it to my mum later. She assured me that I did the best that I could in that situation but that night we came up with a danger code in case I ever was snatched from somewhere. I don't know what these guys were up to, but it sure felt sinister. So this happened roughly 20 years ago. My family was living in a part of Asia that will remain anonymous. And to be honest, screw the background story. I'll just get right into it. So one of my older brothers was out one night with friends doing some drinking as no one ever gets cards in this area and I'm pretty sure no one cared anyway. They were waiting at a bus stop to catch one of the last buses to our area of town and they noticed three men walking down the side of the walkway which led to a pier and something was just definitely not right. The man in front was sobbing and saying a whole bunch of stuff that neither my brother nor his friends could really understand. The men behind him were dressed in suits and had a very stern business as usual look to them. As they got closer to the edge of the pier they could hear the man obviously begging for his life. The other two men said nothing this entire time and obviously had no intentions of letting him leave that pier alive. One of the men reaches into his waistband and, without saying a word, puts one bullet into the guy's head. My brother, knowing that now they've just witnessed something that no one should have witnessed, also knew that they were in immediate danger. It's also midnight and the last bus still has five minutes before it's scheduled to arrive. After devising a quick plan, they get up and run as fast as they can in the opposite direction of our neighborhood, hoping to catch the bus at the previous stop roughly a mile away. But mind you, this is a stretch of road that overlooks a bay and wraps around in a U-shape just beside the waterway. There's really nowhere to hide and there are a lot of streetlights. And just as they can see the bus, they hear tires squealing behind them coming out of the parking lot that links a walkway to the pier and to the beach. They were coming. And that bus was not moving fast enough. Luckily, a cab was coming toward them down the road and they were able to flag it down. And well, this car did not just let them leave. It followed them all the way back to our gated community. You need a pass to get in and it was rather heavily guarded too. My brother, being naive and in a country full of corruption, thought that there was no way that they would ever get in and find out exactly where he lived or who he even was. He didn't tell my parents or anybody for that matter and nothing happened that night so he assumed that everything was all good. But fast forward two days later and my sister decided to walk home from school with a group of friends rather than taking the bus as we lived about a mile and a half from there. My sister begins to notice a, a black Lexus with tinted windows make several passes and slow down enough to where her friends are starting to comment on it. About the time that they were getting in the visual of the guard gate, the car makes one final pass and the driver rolls down the window. The car stops and my guy proceeds to say my sister's name and asks her to come here. All her friends look back at her, making it obvious now that yes, this was indeed my sister, and she gives them a run of the mill, sorry, I don't know who you are, and gets cut off with, no, you need to come here right effing now and tell us where your brother is. Not knowing what to do and not having a cell phone, she tells them a blatant lie stating that he's on the rugby team and that they're practicing on a certain pitch near the school. He didn't actually play rugby but there was practicing going on and well luckily they took the bait and my sister made it home safe. Later that evening my mum and I ran out to the store near the school to get a few things that my dad wanted for the next day. She basically took me everywhere and never really liked leaving me out of her sight. 
Apparently, as a baby, I was taken from her and almost kidnapped. But luckily, these individuals didn't get far, but I was injured in the process as there was a literal struggle between the assailant and the police to get me back. But she hated not knowing where I was after that, and anyway... Upon exiting the store, my mum noticed a few men that look off and tells me to hold a hand as we get closer to the car. And not only have these men moved, but they're coming straight for us. My mother's instincts kicked in and instead of trying to place me in the car and then get into the car herself, she just picked me up and kept me on her lap while she threw the groceries in the passenger seat, cut the car on and we just sped off. As we get to the gate of our neighborhood, the car is just now in our visual field and we are able to make it out through the gate once again and we get home and my mum is just completely hysterical telling my dad what happened. My sister comes up and mentions what happened to her earlier on in the day about my brother and so my mum goes and has a four hour long talk with my brother and my father. My dad comes out of the bedroom and starts making phone calls, lots of them. Both his work phones and our house phones start blowing up with all these people telling him things that he needs to do. Within 20 minutes, we're packing our suitcases and anything that we need for a long vacation, I was told at the time. I was four years old at this point, and within two hours of that point, we were on a plane to Germany. And it wasn't until a few months after staying there that my mum informed me that this is where we were living now. And I was honestly just very confused this whole time, seeing as we weren't doing any of the fun things that we usually do on holidays. And well, we ended up getting too comfortable as not more than four months of being in this location. My dad gets a call stating that the situation had just gotten way worse and that they actually wanted my brother to come back and testify against these guys. And here's what happened. Apparently a middle-aged man was eating dinner at a really upscale restaurant while he was living in Asia. He needed to go to the bathroom and ended up going into the wrong door and proceeded down the hallway until he reached another door. Upon opening it, he had seen one of the biggest cocaine operations run by a certain triad. Apparently, he was able to get out and notify the law about this. They needed him as a witness to the investigation for some reason and he ended up being the guy that they shot that night. My brother was the missing link between the trafficking drugs and trafficking drugs and murder. But even if my brother wanted to, which he didn't, my dad was not going to let that happen and made it quite clear that he would be ignoring any mail sent from that area and would not be answering any phone calls from that country. I remember moving a lot after that for about another two years and every time that we would get situated we'd end up for some reason or another having to move. The organization my dad worked for had armed guards in front of wherever it was that we were staying and we were not allowed to do anything without our driver for a long time. I actually remember him to this day and he was the nicest but biggest sob that I've ever seen. We stayed really good friends with him and he moved with us over those two years every time but unfortunately after this ordeal was over and a few years passed... He was actually killed in a collision where the kidnapping was botched because not only did they kill him in the process, they had killed their target as well. Living in foreign countries, it can be pretty dangerous. I'm a mature female and I used to live in a 55 plus retirement building, pretty much the last place that people go to live before they die. And although it's 55 plus, the average age of the residents was well over 70. So, uh, to begin, I, I want to mention that I've had paranormal or just plain not normal experiences since I was a small child. I moved into the apartment building back in 2010 with my dog Precious and I moved out in 2016. I live in New England and these buildings used to be old mill buildings. Mine was from the 1800s and it was a smaller building with about 28 apartments. There was a basement level with the laundry room and other apartments, the first floor, second floor and third floor. I lived on the second floor so I was high up. I lived in an end unit which was nice and I had adjoining neighbours, one shared a living room wall and one shared the perpendicular kitchen and bathroom wall. My living room wall that was shared with a very nice man was made of brick so there were no privacy concerns and the lady on the other side was just simply never home which was pretty nice. The original lady downstairs below me was elderly and her adult sons would come over and check on her and take care of her. 
One day I was using my blender making a smoothie when there was a really loud bang on the floor. So hard that I could feel it right under my foot. It was like someone just banged a broomstick really hard on the ceiling downstairs. I was taken aback, I mean, what the hell? Was the blender making that much noise? The bang was directly under my feet though and this becomes relevant later. So one day, a few months after that around 5.30am, I hear a loud bang and rumble that woke me up. I knew immediately that this elderly lady had fallen, so I called the police. It took them about 10 minutes to get into the apartment, and sure enough, she was on the floor next to a bed. Two days later, I ran into her sons in the hallway and learned that, unfortunately, the lady had a stroke and had died that day. I also found out that she had been restricted to a wheelchair and was really frail. I mentioned the smoothie incident and apologized for making so much noise, assuming that one of her sons was banging on the ceiling, and they had no idea what I was talking about. But it definitely wasn't the lady, of that I'm sure, so I don't know who was banging on the ceiling. And remember this because it's important. So the next lady who moved in downstairs also had a dog, so I saw her in passing outside and made small talk with her, which actually turned out to be us talking to each other's dogs instead of each other, but she was nice enough. And then there were the upstairs neighbors. Oh boy. The floors creaked in the apartment all the time, so I had to get used to that, but for the first two years, it was always just your average occasional walking around, completely easy to get used to and ignore, and it actually took a long time for me to meet the lady upstairs, Mary. Maybe about six months after I moved in, I was standing outside by the front door with Precious and Mary comes walking out of the door. I immediately knew it was her because I wasn't familiar with this woman and as soon as I saw her, I gasped. There was just something really creepy about this woman. She just reeked of creepiness. It's the only way I can explain it. Her face was just so wrinkled and it looked like it was melting off almost. Her eyes had bags on their bags and she was slightly hunched and it was maybe 85 pounds soaking wet. She was just really thin and she had really wiry curly hair. To be honest with you, she just really startled me at first and then I felt bad about judging this old woman by her looks. So I nervously smiled and introduced myself and we chatted a little. I asked her how long she'd been living there and she said 20 years. And I'm doing my math in the head as this is a 55 plus year building. And this was a little bit weird to me her being there that long living by herself but hey I, I guess she's an old maid or something so am I not 20 years or anything but whatever right so over the next three years everything was just going really nicely although I, I did notice that my dishes were going missing but I just kind of explained it away as me being mistaken I also started noticing that a few times, for several weeks at a time, every time I went to the bathroom, Mary was in the bathroom upstairs, walking around, creaking and then flushing. I totally thought that it was just a coincidence and was actually quite funny. It would last for a few weeks and then stop for months. But the end of 2013 was just a, a very dark time. In November, during Thanksgiving, Precious got really sick and started coughing and couldn't breathe and by the next week, December 4th, she passed away from heart and lung cancer that I had no clue that she even had. She was 8 years old and of a breed that should have lived to at least 12 or 14. And to be honest, I was pretty devastated. I spiraled down into the deepest depression that one could ever get into. I honestly just wanted to be with her and my mind was gone and I didn't cry. I wailed for hours. I pulled out my son's old teddy bears and hugged and slept with them and I just cried on them and my heart was aching and my stomach hurt and the vibes in the apartment just changed. My son would tell me that it just felt different in there, weird and uncomfortable. The energy I was giving off just permeated the entire place, despair, darkness and pain. During my crying fits while on my bed I could hear the familiar creak upstairs right above me and and then it would just go quiet and then creak and then nothing and I began to just feel so uneasy, wondering if this woman was listening to me cry. The separation between upstairs and downstairs was just the subfloor upstairs and a drop of ceiling downstairs, no insulation, no cement, nothing, so you could hear everything between the floors. 
but around December 21, I found my new little girl. Her name is Buffy. She was eight weeks old and very tiny. It was still very hard for me to get through the day, and I still cried a lot, but the needs of Buffy helped me to just keep moving. In 2014, when Buffy was around three months old or so, I would leave her in the kitchen with the gates up whenever I left the apartment. She would have access to the bathroom where her pee pad was, and my bedroom was near the kitchen, so I made it a point to close the bedroom door every single time that I left the apartment. This was as important to me as making sure the stove was off or the iron was off, and I never forgot to close the door. She was still at the stage where she just got into everything, and my room was definitely not puppy-proof. But at times, I would come home, and that bedroom door would just be wide open. I'm talking all the way open to where the door was against the wall. Now, even if I accidentally left the door open, I never opened the door that wide. And this honestly started to give me chills. At first, I convinced myself that I must have just left it open, but I knew deep down that I just didn't. But that was just really the only thing that made sense, because there was no way that someone would break in and just open the door, right? But there's no sign of break-in, and it's not like I live in a high crime building or anything. I mean, come on, it's just a bunch of quiet old people. Once I was taking a shower, and of course I closed the bedroom door because I couldn't see Buffy, when I got out of the shower about 10 minutes later, the bedroom door was wide open again, all the way to the wall. And at that point, I just got a sinking feeling in my stomach. And from there, things just kept escalating. I would be woken up in the middle of the night by various things, and one night I was woken up by a man saying loudly, a hum and the sound was right outside of my room around the corner in the living room and I'm frozen thinking the intruder is in here. I'm wide awake feeling around for my huge hunting knife that I keep next to my bed and then I hear it again. I lay there waiting for him to come into my room and I didn't know how long I waited there but after a while I got up enough guts to check it out, knife in hand, and I slowly walked around the corner to my living room and... I keep a nightlight in my bathroom, so the living room was slightly illuminated, and I did a quick scan of the living room and saw nothing. Then I went closer to the sofa and looked behind it, and there was nothing there either. Then I looked in the doorway and nothing. There was just nothing anywhere. So, confused, I, I just went back to bed. I just laid there thinking about it for a while, and then there was some creaking from upstairs. And I'm thinking, good lord, what a nosy person. It's like 3am, why is she up? And how does she know that I'm even up? I mean, I was sneaking around my apartment trying not to be noticed in case there was an intruder in here. But again, I just pass it off as just another coincidence. I mean, she probably just went to the bathroom. My old lady bladder, right? But it was in 2015 that things really hit the fan. It was the worst year there ever, and me coming home to the door being open continued. But the missing dishes continued, and I had more incidents where I was woken up at night. On one occasion, there was even a growl that woke me up, and it definitely wasn't Buffy. She was still sleeping next to me, and then another time, there was a loud banging on the front door. I looked through the peephole, and there was nothing there. Then, the banging on the floor started again, and one night I was in the kitchen just washing dishes, and there was that familiar bang right under my foot. It happened again the next night, right under my foot, but this time, I was cooking at the stove. So, how the heck do they know where I'm standing? This is the lady downstairs, of course, that I'm thinking at the time, and I didn't understand what I did. I was just standing there cooking. I mean, I wasn't making any noise whatsoever and I was so angry that I reported her to the office the next day. But the office administrator informed me that the lady downstairs wasn't home for the past few days because she had a mild stroke and was actually in hospital. Okay, so this lady had a stroke too? I would hate to live in that apartment, but I digress. So anyway, I just didn't know what to make of that, and I want to make a note here too. Remember how I said that between the floors there's just the subfloor and the drop ceiling? Well, how would someone bang on the ceiling if they had a drop ceiling? 
I mean, I guess they could go through the trouble of moving the ceiling tile, bang on the subfloor, and put the ceiling tile back, but I just can't see an old lady doing this. I mean, if she were home, that is. And remember, too, that the previous lady was restricted to a wheelchair. And then, the knocking on the wall started. At first, it was just a faint knock on my bedroom wall, which is on the other side of the living room. Obviously, there was no one on the other side of the wall because the other side was my living room. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from, though, and it was just a faint knock every five minutes or so. Over the course of the next few weeks, the knocks traveled all over the living room walls, though, and got a lot louder and more frequent, lasting all day long, in fact, coupled with the creaking of the walking from what I thought was the lady upstairs. And these footsteps, they began to follow me just all over the apartment. I kid you not. I was woken up too by what sounded like a jar of pennies or marbles or something thrown on the floor upstairs. It startled both Buffy and me just wide awake in the middle of the night. One night it sounded like someone dropped a huge heavy object that I can only describe to be like a, a big lead safe on the floor right above my bedroom. I was actually awake for that one but remember that this woman is 85 pounds soaking wet. I've had scratching noises in the wall of my bedroom too, like an animal was in the wall or something. Now, one evening I went into the bathroom and the familiar creaking followed me in there and then just all hell broke loose. Again, it was everything. Jar of pennies on the floor, tub of water on and off, sink water on and off, toilet flushing, creaking and I'm just standing there like, what the hell is going on? Because I know that my upstairs neighbor was at the hospital for a back problem and there was just no one home in her apartment. Buffy too had had her share of barking at just nothingness and I actually managed to capture a video of her one day freaking out at something that I couldn't see. I was crocheting just watching TV and relaxing and she was lying right next to me and she then heard a noise in the living room or saw something. I don't know but she just started barking as if she was waiting for it to come back and show itself. And boy, did it. After barking calmly at the doorway for a bit, she reacts as if something just walked right into view and at times her barking starts to escalate with growls as well. And she backs up as if something is coming towards her. She even ducks a few times as if she was trying to avoid being touched or something. Here's the video of that if you'd like to see it. There have been three people who have died in that building just in the five and a half years that I've lived there. One guy who lived next door to the lady above me, who was actually wheelchair bound, actually fell in his tub. He was dead for several days until Meals on Wheels found him and I was living there for that one. The other death was on the first floor near the elevator, way on the other side of the building. But reflecting on all of this, I, I do feel kind of bad about thinking that this lady was doing her best to just harass me and I feel even worse, or mostly embarrassed and stupid, for being paranoid and thinking that she was following me around the house, throwing things on the floor and breaking into my apartment. I honestly wanted so much to just try and find a rational explanation, but when I look back now, me believing that she was following me around was just totally preposterous. I do think though that the death of my other dog and the darkness it brought set just a, an already volatile environment ablaze with activity. I did finally move out but here's the kicker. I now live just across the street and I think that I'm far enough away. Well, I hope so. About 10 years ago, I was working as a waitress at a local diner and living in a low-income apartment. The apartments were brand new and absolutely beautiful and to this day it honestly was the nicest apartment inside that I've ever lived in. I lived on the third floor. Outside it looked nice-ish as well and the landscaping was kept and they had these tall and thick pretty flowering hedges that wrapped around the building. But due to some drug activity it wasn't always the safest place and it was normal to see needles, burnt and bent up spoons, condoms and all that kind of stuff. But we also lived right on a river, close to a downtown area. Less than a mile away there were some homeless shelters and a place called the Daily Bread, where everyone in need could go for a meal. So it wasn't unusual to see homeless people on the road outside of my apartment complex or sleeping on benches by the playground. 
but they never really bothered me, so it wasn't a big deal. Now, I usually worked mornings at my job, but every once in a while I would fill in for someone on the swing shift, 4 to 11. I usually kept my tips in my apron for a few days and then deposited the money on my way home. This particular Sunday, our busiest day, I had worked the evening shift and done really well. So, when I heard that they were short-handed for swing shift, I volunteered to work a double. I ended up doing really well on that shift as well and clocked out at 9.30 with about $250 in my apron. I stopped at my bank to make a deposit through the ATM and got home at around 10.15. I pull up and I see that I have a spot fairly close to the stairwell. It's dark but I can see that there's no one else around so I park and I walk past the hedge and turn right to go up the stairs when out of the corner of my eye I can see a man between the hedge and the building. I look to the right and I can see that he's smoking a cigarette, wearing jeans and a black shirt, and he's covered in paint. He honestly looked like he was on drugs too, wide-eyed and a little bit crazed, and he saw me look at him. I feel creeped out because, well, I'd seen him from my car, and I was wondering why he was standing out of the light and hiding behind the hedge. So I start to take the stairs two at a time, and I get to the top of the first flight of stairs when I hear someone following me. I look back and it was the man. We make eye contact and he was already halfway up the stairs and running at me. I start running too and freaking out internally because even if I beat him upstairs, I might need to unlock my door. My roommate and I usually keep it locked. I keep running as fast as I can and when I get to the top of the second flight, he was like four steps behind me. I run harder and I debate screaming for help and I get to the top of the third flight and I'm still 15 feet from my door and he's almost on me. I can hear him breathing hard and his eyes were bulging and his arms were outstretched to grab me and he was only a foot away from me and my apartment was still 10 feet away. I inhale and open my mouth to scream as loud as I can for help when my 6'4 buff as hell construction worker neighbor opens his apartment door to come out for a smoke. I let out a scream that starts in horror but trails off in relief as my neighbor sees what's happening and starts running to me. The man turned right around and sprinted off at this point and my neighbor chased him to the second floor and then ran back up and yelled for his girlfriend to call the cops. At this point, I'm a hyperventilating, crying and shaking puddle just on the ground and my neighbor comforts me and gets my best friend and roommate to come help me. I honestly thought that that man was about to catch me and hurt me. And looking back, it's more likely that he was going to rob me because I was still wearing my work apron and it was late. But we made a police report where the cop told us that a day labor company for the homeless had a painting contract that they were currently working. The cops made a point to start doing more drives through our complex and my roommate and I bought mace and started calling each other to come and watch the other person come upstairs if it was dark at night when we got home. And I haven't seen the guy since. This happened to me at 2am last night. So, I work out of an art studio in downtown Fargo, ND. It's between the two shadiest bars in town, so I see a lot of odd people. Usually my interactions with them are pretty harmless or sad, but from time to time, someone comes along that just really freaks me out. Last night I was pulling a late one and ended up leaving at around 2am. When I left my shop, I saw that a train was coming through, so I knew that I would have to wait for a while. On my side of the street, I saw a group of men standing around talking. When I stopped, they all looked at me and my gut dropped hard. I really cannot stress just how this gut feeling seemed so instinctual. I see people by these bars all the time, but this was a different sensation. They began to walk to me and I turned to go back to my shop and they increased their pace and the image that is burned into my brain is the one in front. He had a cigarette sticking out of his mouth and was clearly pretending to look the other way as he came near. I dashed into my shop, slammed the door closed and locked it and the man or men tried to open it and began pounding on the other side. They said, let me in man and I grabbed a hatchet from the tools and talked through the locked door. But one thing I've learned from working downtown around these people is that you need to keep a cool demeanor. If you get aggressive or have fear in your voice, they tend to stick around. And so, if my response seems odd, that's why. But let me be completely clear that I was terrified. So, I asked, what's up man? And they said, we've got some ladies out here, let us in, just want to have a good time. 
I say, not interested, leave me alone. They say, we've got more ladies coming, come on. He tried to open the door again and I called 911 and could hear him talking to his friends out front. They weren't laughing though, they were just talking and honestly, that chilled me. Usually the creeps downtown are just drunk and rude and they laugh and blunder around, but these guys, they did not sound drunk one bit. The police eventually showed up and were kind enough to drive me home and the group was pretty much nowhere to be seen. But the thing that freaks me out is that I'm an average sized dude in his mid-twenties. The clothes I was wearing were my shop clothes and did not scream carrying cash. Usually, I'm the one walking girls to their cars in situations like this and I don't know what they wanted. If it wasn't closer to my shop though, I, I don't know what would have happened. So I'll start off by saying that I work third shift at an assisted living home, but the other night shift ladies have told me stories about things that they hear at night and honestly it uh, doesn't really freak me out. Until recently. I could really use some advice because this seven foot shadow man really doesn't seem to like me. So we have six patients and I work alone at night. The place used to be a funeral home, ironic right, and well, I was working one night, and this is when it all started getting creepy. Most of them have dementia too, which is actually kind of surprising when I tell you what happened. So, I went into a patient's room at night, we'll call her Linda. I was by her bed facing her, and she has this just horrified look on her face. So, I ask her what's wrong. She looked at me dead in the eyes and says, There's a tall man behind you and he doesn't like you. He's giving you mean looks and I'm scared. And you better believe that I booked it out of there. Fast forward a few weeks and I'm in a different patient's room. We'll call her Sarah. She tells me the exact same thing. A man is looking at me mean and he doesn't like you. Two months later, another patient tells me the same thing. I just tried to shrug it off until I couldn't anymore because I saw a massive black shadow twice about seven foot tall. But we have no male patients and I've heard a man full on whistling a tune from the basement one time. It didn't really freak me out too much but I hate that basement and avoid it at all costs. My co-worker was telling me that a patient woke up one night so she went into the room and the lady told her that she had to get ready for the funeral. She shrugs it off because this lady has dementia, but two minutes later, another patient who also has dementia gets up and she goes into the room to check on her. She looks at my co-worker and says, I have to get ready for the funeral. My co-worker brushed it off as just a coincidence, but three minutes later, another patient gets up. She has no dementia too and is in her right mind and very aware and my co-worker again goes into this lady's room and the patient says, wow, I had the weirdest dream. A, a man came into my room and told me to get ready for the funeral in the basement. Three people within 15 minutes said the exact same thing. And well, safe to say it doesn't bother me much anymore but I would like to know what this shadow person wants and why he hates me so much. At 18 years old, I was living in Southern California with my mother and two siblings. The area was a relatively new development that seemed constantly under construction. The home that we were living in had already proven to be a bit, well, unwelcoming as we'd already had some bizarre and just frightening experiences. Working part time, my shifts were varied to account for college courses and the need to help at home with my sister and brother, both still in high school. I came home from work one day and found that my jerk of a younger brother had taken everything out of his bedroom and transferred it into my own. He'd done the same with my things, like my clothes, pictures, furnishings, pretty much everything in fact. Without so much as a mention of his intentions, he'd stolen my bedroom just right out from under me. My room had once been a two-car garage but served as a converted den. From that, I was being given a bedroom just large enough to fit a full bed and a dresser, all thanks to a chubby 15-year-old jerk with a recent attitude change that had me ready to explode. When I complained, he told me to just get over it. 
and experience told me that I wouldn't win this battle and it just wasn't worth upsetting my mum over. So, as upset as I was, I decided to just leave it alone. It was already late anyway and everyone else had gone to bed, so I headed off to do the same. But prior to this night, I hadn't spent much time in my brother's, my new room. I didn't know anything about it really. I didn't know that it would be different than any other room in the house. Where we had once been close, my brother and I now had a strained and volatile relationship. He'd become just an entirely different person in a matter of a few short weeks and I honestly didn't know why. But I was tired of his recent aggression and really tired of him too. I stalked into my room though and was just immediately struck by the freezing cold. I was used to sleeping in a converted garage and accustomed to cold, but this was just something else. Something more. I nervously walked up to the window assuming that it had been left open or something, but I quickly saw that it hadn't been. And at this point, I was just immediately overcome by fear. I had turned out the light on my way into the room and found myself amid only darkness and fear. I turned and had to fight the urge to sprint the short three feet into bed. It wasn't easy, but my arms were already covered in goosebumps and my heart was just beginning to race. I still can't exactly say what was causing it, but I was terrified, that much I knew for sure. Yes, the room was cold and I had goosebumps, but it was more than that. There was just a, an energy or a presence that seemed to be in complete control of my every emotion. I grabbed a fistful of blankets and covered myself head to toe, and almost immediately I began to hear what I can only describe as a, a swishing sound. It was all around me and encircled the room, but from up top near the ceiling. The sound grew louder and louder and I wanted nothing more but for it to stop and I wanted to scream as badly as ever, but I just couldn't get a single word out. I felt like I was no longer even breathing and was positive that I was holding my breath. The swishing was becoming increasingly louder and more chaotic sounding and it had been envisioning every horrible sight that I could imagine. After what I felt like an eternity hiding under the blankets, I decided that I needed to actually see for myself what was still causing the sounds around me. I had to know what was happening. I mean, anything was better than the images that I was conjuring up in my mind. I moved just enough of the blanket to expose my eyes and see what was happening and in the darkness of the small room was a a much darker thing. I remember the shock that I felt as I thought, the darkness has darkness, and I know it makes very little sense, but that's exactly how I perceived it. But the terror was so palpable and present, it just it felt like solid matter. Not merely an emotion, but rather something possessing of an, an actual physical form. It was so strong too that it had successfully robbed me of any ability to move or even speak. It's not an exaggeration to say that it felt as if terror was rising quicker and quicker inside me. My heartbeat sounded like a countdown to an even more horrific event and I just knew that I'd be unable to cope. As the terror continued to build, I slowly tried to bury my face into the bedding. As terrified as I was, I could not get up to run out. It was a difficult enough effort to merely hide my face, so running out was inconceivable. I was paralyzed with fear and until that night, the term had just never made more sense to me. But suddenly and unexpectedly, there was an abrupt stop though to all the noise. Just complete silence. I could hear my breath coming out in loud and rapid pants and the silence I just desperately longed for now sounded just horribly loud. And then, something happened that just pushed me over the edge. I felt, like literally felt, painful pressure from the close proximity of someone or something leaning onto my ear. I could feel its cold breath hit the back of my neck and the side of my face and a lifetime of terrifying seconds passed when a sudden guttural laugh filled my room and head. It had begun immensely low but it quickly opened up seeming to loudly shoot straight out of its mouth. It was the most maniacal laugh that I've ever heard. I shot out of bed at this point and began screaming immediately. That was enough to break the terrible spell of paralysis that had kept me imprisoned in the bed for far too long. But the nightmare wasn't over yet. I burst from the room only to run almost head first into my mother, 
She was running into the hallway towards what I thought was my rescue, and at almost the same time, I saw my brother running from my old room, his face pale as I had ever seen it. And from between his room and my own, my 17-year-old sister had flung open her own door. We would have looked like something out of a comedy if we all hadn't have been so terrified, but upon reaching me, my mum just grabbed me by my shoulders attempting to push me off to the side. Forcing her way past me, she was yelling, it's a monkey, what the hell is a monkey doing in the house? I too was yelling, there's someone or something in my room in the dark. I realized my sister was also yelling something out, but I was unable to comprehend her words. My brother just stood there looking pale and terror-stricken, not speaking. And just then, the most putrid, rotting smell filled the area, enveloping us all. The stench was so strong that it almost brought me to tears, burning my eyes and nose. Its odor was just so offensive that I knew exactly what it was despite never having smelled it before. It was sulfur. My mum knew too and she said it just like that, just sulfur. The realisation of what we were dealing with took over and she began taking charge of the situation immediately. Loudly and with boldness that both impressed and strengthened me, she began calling out to God and asking him to hear our prayers, rebuking anything in the name of Christ. I remember hearing childhood Bible verses that she taught us proclaimed from her lips. She loudly declared above the slightest quiver in her voice that we were to join hands. She boldly decreed that our home belonged to Christ and our authority came directly from God in heaven. Soon, we all were praying, holding hands in the hallway, and almost immediately, the offensive odor just left. And in its place, only the faint and strangest smell of what I can only describe of roses. It lingered for a while, and although I can't explain it, it was accompanied by a peace that seemed impossible after the events from just minutes ago. My mum went on to explain to me that she'd never heard my screams. She'd been in and out of the restless sleep when the couch she was laying on had been lifted by its end at least three feet in the air. As she tried to sit up, it was dropped, let go by whatever unseen entity had lifted it to begin with. The impact from the couch hitting the floor pulled her out of any shock and disbelief she was feeling. Despite the darkness of the room, the moon cast enough light that she clearly could see what she believed was a, a cat in the room with her. A cat had no place in our home. I mean, my mum was never an animal lover, but she allowed us to have a dog throughout our childhood, but that was it. But still, a cat sat watching her from the corner of the room. The moonlight cast an eerie glow on the animal, but it was what she saw next that still has the power to give her shivers. Her struggles to sit upright had jolted the animal into motion. Turning to flee the room, it had given her its back, exposing my mum to the unmistakable back end of a monkey. Yeah, a monkey. Its long tail curled around itself several times, resting high atop its bottom. She says that as it flashed a horrible look at her, she stared into its eyes that glowed red. This thing was simultaneously two animals or something. My mum ran after it, chasing it into the hallway and watched as it hit the door to another room in the home and ran inside. This particular room should have been my mum's bedroom, but instead it sat empty and unused due to its own paranormal activity. It was right after seeing the animal hit the door and scurry into the room on what now appeared to be hind legs that I ran almost head first into my mum and siblings in the hallway. My younger sister tells me that she hadn't heard or experienced anything specific to have brought her from her room that night, just that she suddenly felt an abundance of fear and a need to get out of her room as fast as she could. Terror, it seems, had tried its best to take up residence in the home that night. But why? Well, within a week, we had our answer. My brother had started seeking answers to his life from one place that we always knew we had no business engaging in the dark arts. Much to all of our disbelief, he had strayed as far from our upbringing in church as possible. He'd taken up reading tarot cards and seeking out answers from the powers of darkness, as everyone called it, via seances. He was trying actively to gain wisdom and power from the devil. He had also been using meth in his room for weeks and the paranormal activity that resulted as a consequence of his actions had become unbearable for him. And this is what had motivated the room change. He'd been scared to the point of being unable to even stay in the room one more night. 
The decisions that he'd made and his lifestyle choices at the time were what, in my opinion, accounted for the evil that filled the small space of my room that night and permeated the rest of the home too. And it was a night that none of us will ever forget. I remember this clear as day, and it easily had to be at least 21 years ago now. I was just out of school and had an older sister, only 11 months my senior. But we were extremely close, and she was a young mum living away from home for the first time ever. My nephew Johnny was the only one at the time and just three years old. He was literally the apple of my eye, and I think I worked solely to buy him Disney movies and toys, and he knew how loved and spoiled he was and relished coming to visit. I was so bad, in fact, that he'd grown accustomed to greeting me at the door with his hand out, awaiting for the day's surprise. So, we hadn't been living in the home very long, and it was relatively new, in a suburban cul-de-sac. I didn't think anything strange happened in new homes, and after a short period of time, he started acting fussy whenever he was over and stopped wanting to visit as much. My younger sister and brother, his aunt and uncle, were in high school and they too spoiled him, so I didn't understand what the problem could be. I came home from work one day to find him running out of the den as fast as his little legs could carry him. He had a look on his face too that made me drop his day's surprise and run towards him, hurriedly scooping him up. The den served as the master bedroom with his and her bath and it just held such a, a weird energy about it that nobody used that room. So much so, in fact, that my mum actually opted to sleep in the living room every night. I could see something was wrong, though, and immediately asked him what it was. I noticed that he was holding his cheek, and moving his hand, I saw a really large red welt forming. Again, I asked him what was wrong and what had happened. Pulling me by my hand, he pushed the door open as hard as he could, and pointed to a seemingly empty corner of the room. Looking up at me and flashing an angry look at what I perceived to be emptiness, he said, The little girls are right there. They're mean. They said, get out of here. You can't play. And tell them, auntie, that it's not nice to hit. They always yell at me. And well, after that, we didn't go in the den anymore. Not even to use the restroom. That was only the beginning of a lot of eerie incidences in that home, but we moved shortly after, but only after learning that the entire development had been built over what was formerly a Native American burial site. Anyone who knows me knows that my mum is just a, a firecracker. She settled down since adopting me, and all that fire has now turned to fierce mama bearness, but... She's also always been very alert of her surroundings and shared this story with me after I told her how I think I was almost kidnapped at the mall this past week. So, when my mum was young, she and a group of her girlfriends went to a dance. She's always attracted attention in her younger years. Obviously, not all of it was wanted. And this guy that she knew who had asked her out previously asked her to dance. She turned him down in favour of hanging out with her friends. It was a girl's night after all and she didn't like it. He seemed to take this pretty well, but later came back with a drink for her and she told me the drink just didn't seem right. She didn't say how, but just that the drink seemed strange. It's my guess that it was just her gut instincts telling her not to take a single sip. And the place that they were at had a, a dirt floor, so she secreted the glass beneath the table and just dumped it out. Her girlfriend next to her yelled about her shoes getting wet, but mum shot her a glare that instantly silenced her. I know that glare all too well. So, she noticed this guy watching her for the rest of the night, and when she went home, he had followed her and knocked on her door. She answered, and he looked surprised to see her so alert and oriented. She asked what he wanted, and he asked how she was feeling. She told him that she was fine, and after staring at her, he asked if she was tired and if she wanted him to come in. She slammed the door in his face and locked it, and slept with her pistol that night, while asking herself, what the heck did he put in that drink? So, this happened just a few hours ago at 2am. 
I live in an apartment complex downtown that's also filled with lots of university students, but the building also houses many of the non-university students on the top floor where the penthouses are. A little bit of background info too. I'm sort of a, a manager, resident advisor for the uni students that live in the building. There are three of us and someone is on call every night with a central on-call phone to deal with any issues that students may have. I woke up at 2.20am to someone knocking on my door. Now, I use knocking loosely here as the person was basically kicking and pounding and body slamming my door while trying to use the keypad to key in over and over. I quietly looked out of my peephole and saw a man who seemed under the influence. At the time, I was terrified that things would get worse if he knew that I was home, so I tried to be as quiet as possible. I grabbed a kitchen knife for reassurance, went to my room and started calling the person on call to help me, but he wasn't picking up. I called the person above me, area duty, and told them the situation, but they weren't really sure what to do and thought that maybe we had to call the city's police or something but said that she would call around and then call me back. I would have immediately called the police already, but the last three times I've called them for other issues as an RA here, I've had to go down and badge them into the building. I was terrified of having to unlock my door and go out, so I just started calling everyone else that I knew in the building. One, to get someone to see what the heck was going on from the other side, and two, to get someone to open the building door for the police if I were to call them. I called my friends, the other community managers and RAs, my supervisor, but no one was picking up. The person on area duty finally calls me back and says that the higher-ups just want to have an extra set of eyes on the situation, but she doesn't have a car, so she wants me to wait until she can call an Uber. I'm honestly terrified at this point and go back out to my living room and see that the bottom left corner of my door had been kicked in, and the only thing keeping it from opening is the deadbolt. It's 2.52am now and the guy's pounding and trying to key in stops so I look out my peephole and see one of my residents down the hall talking to this guy for 5 minutes before leaving in the elevator. I wait a minute or two and then come out of the apartment to go knock on the residence door and he told me that he was about to write me a note because he thought that I was probably inside just terrified. He was right. He apparently came out because the pounding was so loud and reverberating that he thought someone was at his door. The guy was trying to get into his girlfriend's apartment apparently and didn't have his phone on him. Additionally, the passcode his girlfriend gave him wasn't working. My resident let him borrow his phone to call his girlfriend and turns out she's directly a floor above me. The resident was always a super nice guy and gave me his number in case anything ever happens in the future. I took a look at my door and it's almost falling off the bottom two hinges. But considering this went on for 40 minutes, I can see why my door is in such bad shape too, but also, I mean, who does this? Even if you are intoxicated and you thought it was your girlfriend's apartment, why would you try to break down the door to get in? Oh, well, the RA manager on duty finally comes over to my apartment at 3am after area duty finally got in touch with them and saw the damage. I filled them in and we went upstairs to talk to the guy. The girlfriend opens the door, asks us what we want and after asking to talk to her boyfriend, she's pretty adamant about not wanting to wake him up because he's exhausted. Okay, so I show her the photos of the damage and she seems pretty upset so she tries waking him up to no avail but we were pretty clear that we weren't leaving until we talked to him. He finally gets up and says sorry because he had the wrong door. He was talking to the person on duty most of the time and not really acknowledging me. He probably thought it was his room and not mine. I showed him the photos and he denies that he caused the damage, saying that he only knocked pretty softly. He even demonstrated his knocking in three different instances during our conversation. His girlfriend in the back seemed pretty upset and disappointed in him and he snapped at her saying, well what was I supposed to do? I didn't have my phone and you didn't pick up earlier. Apparently, they just moved in on Sunday and he didn't remember where his room was. The person on duty and I asked to see his ID and asked if we could take a picture, which he agreed to. We left and I filed a maintenance request for the door, wrote an email to my boss and the leasing manager and also called the police to file a report. The police came and I let them into the building, showed them the damage and explained everything. 
They said it was probably an honest mistake and just gave me a case number to give to the leasing manager so they can bill for potential charges and then they went upstairs to talk to the boyfriend and girlfriend. I asked if they could give me an update afterwards, mostly for my sanity and reassurance, but they said it was unnecessary and there really wasn't anything else I needed to know. It was honestly a terrifying experience and I'm glad that I'm alive because I honestly thought I was going to die that day. But this had me pretty shook and I usually would have been up at 2am but I'm trying to go to sleep earlier because I'm taking the MCAT tomorrow and I'm trying to do some last minute studying while I wait for someone to come fix my door, hopefully today. In retrospect, I'm pretty worried for the girlfriend upstairs because the guy wasn't exhibiting normal behavior, that's for sure even for someone that is intoxicated. I'm going to try to be extra cognizant of noises from upstairs and I'll call someone if it sounds like there's any instances of domestic violence or abuse. Between the ages of 13 and 17, I used to babysit for my sister's two kids, she has four now, frequently because she would like to go out to party with her friends. We lived in an apartment complex and she lived in the apartment just above my parents' apartment so it was very easy access. I was babysitting for her upstairs in her apartment one night when I was 14 and the kids, but for context it was a 3 year old boy and a 9 year old girl, were in the living room with me and we had watched cartoons together until they fell asleep and then I left the couch to go onto the computer and talk to a friend of mine on MSN that lived in the apartment complex across from my own. Everything was normal until I heard crying coming from my niece's bedroom, which was very obviously her crying. I left the computer and went down the hall into her bedroom where she was laying asleep in her bed and I watched for a moment thinking that maybe I was going crazy because she was sleeping, not crying. Then I turned back toward the living room and it didn't take three steps down the hallway before I remembered that my niece and nephew, they were asleep in the living room. And so... Who was that in the bed? Completely freaked out at this point, I checked the living room to confirm that they were both there before heading into my niece's room again. And there, in her bed, was absolutely nothing. It was then that I decided to rush back into the living room and tell my friend to call me because I was honestly terrified. She called me and while we spoke on the phone, I never took my eyes off of the kids. And it was then that a little toy truck that was resting on the stand on one side of the living room flew toward the television on the other side and that is when I started to cry like an absolute baby. I begged my friend to stay on the phone with me until my sister came home and I didn't budge from the computer chair. But when my sister came home that night I literally bolted from her apartment and into the safety of my own downstairs. The next night I joined her and her significant other at the time for supper. As I began to tell her and her partner what I had encountered the other night before, the power just coincidentally went out. There could have been several different reasons for that power outage, but the timing had me zip my mouth shut and throw the key away. Years later when I was 19, my sister and I got talking about paranormal activities. I told her the full story of what happened to me on that night and she admitted that she has had strange things happening to her in multiple apartments she's lived in throughout the years. Her most recent experience I heard of was her second daughter, five years old at the time, kept crying about a, a man watching her in her bedroom door at night. But one night when my sister was comforting her back to sleep, she could hear very clear and heavy footsteps coming toward the room in the hallway, stopping just before the door and then fading off back into the distance. And she moved out a week later. So I've been on Grinder for about 10 years now, five of which were actually illegal and not proud of it, and have had plenty of just messed up experiences. But this one in particular reminds me of when I was at a party without my car, I was 19 and in college, and my phone was on 10%, but a decently hot Grinder guy said that he could pick me up and we could hang at his place before he drove me home, so of course I jumped on the opportunity. Anyway... We got to his place and he got me pretty drunk, which wasn't unusual for me, but never tried to make a move or anything. I assumed he was going to wait and just convinced me to stay the night later. Finally, my phone died after like two hours. The last 1% lives a lot longer than the rest. 
and I didn't even have to say anything before he noticed it was dead. Then he stood up and was like, well, let's go to the car then. When I asked if he had a charger that I could use, he just said no. After we got to the car, he kind of got quiet and less flirty and I spaced out just enjoying his music and looking out the window. And I didn't even notice that he never asked where I lived until I realized that we'd been driving for over an hour now not even towards my town, but into the canyons, the Greater Salt Lake City, UT area. And I asked where he was going, and he just said he thought that we could go for a drive. And my drunk ass was like, oh, okay. So, to make a long story shorter, he ended up taking us four or five miles, I think, down a dirt road with no signs or houses until it dead-ended into this cabin with no lights on or cars outside and he parked and turned the car off. And that's when the dread started to creep in and as I sobered up, I said I drank too much and should probably head home. But he didn't even respond. He just kind of sat there staring at the cabin. Then he was like, you said you like being kinky, you're pretty submissive, correct? And I was like, uh, sure, but I just meant like normal rough things, nothing too wild. And he started sounding a little annoyed and his sentences seemed a little less carefully worded, like he was just spitting out the bare minimum of each thought. He said something about how some of his favorite people are those who kind of find pleasure in pain and like if someone goes into shock enough times eventually it becomes like a drug and they crave more. Then something about pushing a person into the deep end is the fastest way to teach them to swim. I don't know but at that point I was scared enough to assert myself and said firmly, okay well that sounds fun but just not tonight. I just want to go home now and this place is creepy. And he just sighed and gripped his keys tighter. Then, right as I glanced at his phone sitting in the cup holder, right before it occurred to me to grab it, he snatched it up so fast and held it in his left hand, kind of behind his head, to make it clear that he was not going to let me near it. And I made this kind of what sound, and he just gave me this almost, uh, I'm proud of you son, half smile, like dads do when they pat your shoulder or something, and... It was quiet and he kept looking me up and down for a minute or so and then it got a little more gruff and said, let's go inside. I have these friends you'll really like once you meet them. You'll feel a lot better or something to that extent but he wasn't even trying to sound genuine or comforting like he'd been doing so well earlier in the night. Finally, I lied and spoke up a bit and told him, I told my roommates and my friend that I was meeting up with them before you picked me up. I sent screenshots of your face and some of the convo. They're going to freak out if I don't charge my phone and reply to them in the next few hours. I tried not to make it sound accusatory, but more like I was just worried about my friends going crazy, but it was clear that he knew what I was implying. At that point, he let out an exasperated grunt and sigh and started the car and drove away. Kept the headlights off all the way back down the dirt road for some reason too. Driving back, I got nervous about him stalking me and coming after me in the future, so I tried to apologize and tell him that I'd be down for hanging out another time maybe, but tonight just wasn't great for me and blah blah blah. But he didn't say a single word the whole drive back and didn't even ask where I lived. I didn't intend to tell him either, but he dropped me off at a McDonald's about 40 miles from my apartment and when I was stepping out of the car, he suddenly leaned over and gave me a hard shove so I almost fell out the rest of the way and he grabbed my backpack off the floor and flung it out of his window across the parking lot and peeled out with the passenger door still open. It actually broke my laptop and cracked my phone and I had to ask a stranger to use her charger and call an Uber but at that point I was just so anxious to get home that I really didn't care. But what was so weird though was how while it was happening even though I was terrified I guess I wasn't thinking about exactly what he was planning to do with me. I just knew that I needed to get away and so it wasn't until I got home and got in the shower that I realized just how messed up it all was and what might have happened if I'd let him walk me into the cabin and all that stuff. 
I remember just being so shaken and smacked by the reality of it that I almost felt like a panic attack, so I sat down in the shower with my head between my knees and just cried until it ran cold and I got out and woke my roommate up to tell him about it and he kind of calmed me down. So, while I still do have a grinder account, I, I really just use it as an ego boost. I'm reluctant to meet up with anyone from it now, and anyways, I suppose the moral of the story is you got to be really careful out there because you just don't know who you may run into. This is a story about a paranormal experience that I had a few years ago and is by far the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. So, it happened over the course of three nights when I was staying at my grandma's house. My grandma lives in a house in pretty much the middle of nowhere on an abandoned Christmas tree farm. All the trees are diseased and dying at this point though. Also, at this time she had a boyfriend that was staying there too. This is important to the story later. Anyways... I was staying in my new bedroom in the basement for the first night. It was all the back of the basement at the end of this small little hallway. My grandma had said goodnight and left and turned off all the lights and I left the door to my room open. And then I noticed a, a figure standing outside the doorway. It was completely black and had no features at all. I just stared at it in fear and couldn't move. I really wanted to turn the light on but the light switch was right beside the doorway and there was no way I was going anywhere near that thing. Finally I ended up turning around and facing the wall and forced myself to just go to sleep after glancing back at it a few times mind you to see if it was still just standing there. In the morning I ran upstairs and asked my grandma if she or her boyfriend had been downstairs to check on me or something and she said no, no one had been down there. I was like... Huh, but let it go and wrote it off as me imagining things or my mind just playing tricks on me. Once again, I go downstairs for bed the next night and when all the lights were off once again, the figure was there again. But this time, instead of being outside the doorway, it was standing right in it. I was scared but did the same thing as the night before and turned to face the wall and forced myself to sleep despite feeling like something was watching me intensely. The third and last night I stayed in that room, when the lights turned off, it was back again, but this time it was inside of my room, just inside the doorway. I was extremely terrified, but once again turned around to face the wall and forced myself to just go to sleep. But in the morning, when I woke up, I told my grandma that I did not want to sleep down there anymore because it was creepy as hell. I'm still terrified of that basement and regularly have nightmares about it and they always center around that room. I truly believe that there's something evil in that house and that it's attached to that room in some way. For context, I was 22 years old, a female and a senior in college. During my senior year in college, I was following a particular politician and was going to rallies and other events in my spare time. Me and my friends were having a ball and loved being involved, and one particular rally that I went to was in the city. My friends and I took a train in and enjoyed ourselves. On the way home, back to our university, I noticed a guy sitting across from us that I had recognized from campus. He was pretty cute, and I remember seeing him around as we must have had some sort of mutual friends. I said hi to him and to my delight, he also recognized me. We spoke for a few minutes and discovered that we were both at the same rally. By the end of the train ride he asked me for my phone number and I remember thinking, wow, a cute guy and we have some things in common. I gave him my number but I didn't think much past that. About a week later I received a text from him. He asks if I'm free this weekend and if I'd be interested in meeting up and having a drink. But this particular time was during break from school so not many people were around and for whatever reason I chose not to go home and in my naive mind at the time I thought great I have my own place all to myself. I meet him at a local bar and we have a few drinks. It was pretty quiet for a Friday as it was break time and after an hour or two decided to leave. I invited him back to my place for a bottle of wine and to hang out some more and he wound up staying the night and leaving in the morning. But when I woke up, for whatever reason, I just had this uneasy feeling. Nothing bad had happened per se, I just didn't like how things had went. 
I felt like he was just so serious, not laughing or smiling the entire evening. And although he always had a drink in his hand, I realized that he wasn't really drinking them. The entire evening, he was just kind of shifty and nervous. The only way I can describe it is like he was on a mission and waiting for something. These were obviously all red flags to me, and although I felt bad, I, I just wasn't interested in this guy. To my relief, he didn't text me for a while after that, and I assumed that he came to the same realization that it just wasn't a good match. That is, until about two to three weeks later, he writes me a message telling me that he's been busy but really wants to meet this weekend and catch up. This particular weekend, my older sister was having a huge party for her husband's birthday at their house, a few towns away. A few of my friends and I were going, and there was always a pretty large group of people at their parties, about 50 to 60 I'd say. And let me be clear that these parties were not your typical get wasted and stay up till the cops get called type college parties. They were more of a, an adult type party, given my sister's husband is fairly older than us. Don't get me wrong, there was plenty of drinking going on and they were really fun, just more of a, an adult type barbecue with a day of drinking and just hanging around. Me and my two girlfriends were going to spend the night there too as I was going to drive there but obviously we would be drinking and the party started early at 12pm. Against my better judgement I invited him to the party thinking that well it couldn't hurt right? I gave him the address and time and he seemed really interested and agreed to come. The day of the party was really fun and my friends and I were having a blast. I must admit though that I did have sort of a sinking feeling and was not looking forward to seeing the guy. Then to my absolute and utter relief I get a text from him saying that he'll be unable to make it and so I finally could just relax and enjoy the party. By about 12am, everyone is exhausted from a, a day of full-on drinking and the party is winding down. Most of all the guests have gone home except for my friends and a few of the other guys, the friends of my sister's husband who were also sleeping there and of course my sister and her husband. My sister has one guest room which was taken and a fully carpeted and finished basement. We had various blankets and pillows and we're all going to just sleep down there on the couches or pretty much anywhere that you could lay. Now, as I'm about to go down to the basement and get ready for sleep, the man just walks through the front door. No knocking, no text, no anything. Just confidently walks straight in the house. And I don't know why, but my initial reaction was fear. I pretended to be happy to see him and gave him a small hug, and I asked him why he was there, to which he never gave a real response. All of the lights were out, and pretty much everyone was gone at this point. I was gesturing around and hinting at him that the party was over and that he had missed it. I actually felt pretty bad that he'd made the effort to come out and so I decided to speak with him for a few minutes before I just went to bed. We talked and I told him that I was going to go and get ready for bed and that I'm sorry he missed the party. He says, yeah that's fine and that this dude is just not getting the hint to leave. I leave the room and go to change my clothes and set myself up a bed, brush my teeth and I'm just hoping that he'll leave, but I don't hear any movement from the other room. When I come back to the living room to check and see if he's actually still there, he is, and he's asleep on the couch now. I obviously found this strange, but just assumed that it was late and that he must have been really tired. He didn't seem out of place as there were various other people sleeping at the house as well, and I went to the basement and found myself a place to sleep on the floor. About 30 minutes to an hour later, I'm lying on the floor still awake, thinking about just how weird it was that he showed up. It's pitch black and there's a few other people sleeping there, including my friends, and I hear someone in the dark slowly coming down the stairs. I see that they're holding a cell phone light to guide them, and as the figure reached the bottom of the steps, I see that it's him. Now, he's never been to this house that's in a nice suburban area, not a frat house, and I did immediately think it was weird that he would just randomly be walking through a house of a person that he doesn't know. I pretend to be asleep, and as I lay frozen there, I suddenly feel a tap on my shoulder. He doesn't say a word, and he's over me and trying to wake me up. I don't move, and I pretend to be asleep, and I lay there in the dark silence and am listening for his footsteps to walk away. I can tell that he's holding a light over me and 
Then, with absolutely no warning, this man takes a step back and with his boot on, kicks me full force straight in the face. Now, I'm not talking about a little tap with a foot to wake me up. No, I mean a full force boot kicks me directly in my face. My face goes immediately numb and I don't know what the heck just happened. I can feel blood running down my nose and I open my eyes and look at him and all I can remember saying is something like, why did you do that? He just stared at me blankly and said nothing, turned around and walked back up the steps. I just laid there paralyzed in fear. My heart is beating a million times a minute. I don't know how long it was until I garnished the courage to get up, but eventually I army crawl in the dark over to my friend. Another man near her wakes up as well and I explain what happened. We're all half drunk, dazed and confused to say the least and I can't stay in this basement anymore. We're all half drunk and dazed and confused to say the least and I just can't stay in this basement anymore. I know that he left but I was terrified and my friend and the other guy offered to take me upstairs so that I can sleep in my sister's room. I go into my sister's room and lay next to her bed on the floor and I shut the door behind me but unfortunately there was no lock. I don't know how but eventually I fall asleep and at some point, it's now morning, I wake up to my sister leaning over me and she asks what happened to your face and why are you in my room? Right as I'm about to answer her, my friend who had helped me the night before comes flying into the room. She tells us that the guy is still there and asleep on the couch. She runs out and I can hear her screaming at him to get up and get out. I hear him arguing back and asking where I am and my friend tells him that I've left and begins arguing that he knows my car is still there. Now, I have no idea how he knew which car was mine as he had never seen it before and he also argued that I didn't take my purse. Eventually he does leave, but after that night, he wrote me a message a few days later as if nothing had happened, asking to hang out again. I blocked him at this point, and I have never heard from him again after that. I graduated only two months later, and thankfully I never saw him on campus again. To this day, I have no idea why he kicked me in the face, and how he had the balls to just stay there after that too. And I'll tell you one thing that I know for sure. I've certainly learned my lesson about giving out my phone number. So I used to work at Borders way back when. Though I did have another job at the mall. Something about being at the bookstore just made me much more recognizable I guess as well. I often had people approach me when I was on the street or ask me about the store sales and all that sort of stuff while I was at drive through windows too. It was mostly harmless stuff though, I did get some creeps on occasion. At the time I had a dating profile up but I had to take it down because I'd started getting weird messages from men saying that they saw me at the grocery store or something and wanted to touch themselves. Just bizarre stuff and the killing blow that made me finally close it however came shortly before my 19th birthday. So I was checking my account after work and I see a message titled we've met which immediately creeped me out as it would anybody right? I clicked on it and it said sort of before proceeding to go into this very weird and graphic depiction of this guy who is apparently so thrilled by my cashiering skills that I caused a stirring in his loins. This email was seriously like three pages long too, talking about how sexually excited he was and all of the things that he could do to my young body. I was horrified to think that one of my customers had been looking at me like that, thinking those things, and I clicked on his profile and no photo. But it said that he was 56 and single, but no other information. I needed to know what he looked like, which is the only reason I replied, and I imagined that that was his game all along. I didn't respond to any other stuff that he said, but I asked him if he'd send me a photo. He told me that he couldn't put one up because he's sort of a public figure, but he told me that he'd email it to me. It took him two days to get back to me, and those were two very long days. While I waited, I looked at my message history and discovered that this guy had actually written to me many times. I'd ignored him because, one, no pictures, and two, way out of the age group that I was looking for. 
but out of morbid curiosity, I looked at the messages and all of them were filled with just sexually graphic things that he wanted to do to me. He talked about fantasies of using me with another man that he knew, acting out rape scenes and tying me up. Some of the details were specific to me too, which leads me to believe that he wasn't sending them en masse to every young woman on the site. Meanwhile, this guy is older than my dad though. I spent the next two days tensing around every older man who came in and I was afraid to be friendly to any of them for fear that one of them would be this guy and he'd take it as a go ahead to come at me. I was having a birthday celebration the day that he finally got back to me and the moment that I saw his name... I got a bad feeling in my stomach. I could immediately place it, but I knew that there was something wrong with this person writing these things to me. I stared at it for a moment, positive that I knew this guy, but my brain just wouldn't click. I texted my friend to confirm with her as it began to dawn on me that this man was my high school principal. I was horrified. I mean, I was still 18 at the time, which means that he must have been creeping on a bunch of us all along. I actually remember being alone with him in his office and it makes me feel queasy when I think about it. Is he just perched and waiting for girls to graduate so that he can legally pounce? I wrote him back and told him that I don't know if you remember me but you are my high school principal and I happen to know that you're married. He didn't reply and I thought that that was the end of it. I was still super creeped out for a while after that though, just knowing how long he'd been thinking about me and sending me these graphic messages, when he'd been an authority figure in my formative years. Almost a year passed with that incident and he didn't come in when I was there, but one day I started ringing someone up without getting a good look at his face. It was a friendly exchange, right up until I made eye contact. And, you guessed it, it was him again and he was grinning at me. I put his stuff in his bag and turned away from the register, but he stayed where he was. I pretended to organize some returns, but he just kept standing there, silent, not moving or anything, and just watching me. But I didn't want to look, and the moment lasted far too long, so I finally grabbed my headset and asked a manager to come to the front of the store. And at this point, he just hurried out after that, and... I never saw him again. So I want to share an experience that I had when I was around 16 to 17, about 12 years ago. So one night, I suddenly woke up from my sleep and immediately sensed something was off. I saw the clock and it was around 3 to 3.30 a.m., not thinking much of it, I was just going to roll over and try to fall back to sleep. That was until I realized that I couldn't move. I was laying on my back and just felt a, a huge surge of panic rush through my body. This had never happened to me before and I had no idea what sleep paralysis even was at the time. I was trying to kick my legs and wave my arms, scream out for my parents, but no luck. Sleep paralysis aside, there was an eerie feeling in the air that was making me feel extremely vulnerable and more scared than I already was. In the midst of my internal panicking, I felt my left arm slowly start to move, but I was not the one moving it. It started to move towards my face and I was trying to use all of my non-existent power to try and stop it. As it slowly started going towards my neck, I remember trying to scream for my parents, but it was just me screaming in my head. Then, my own hand started choking me. I couldn't stop it and I couldn't move, couldn't scream, just kept thinking, I'm about to die right now. Growing up, I was raised in a Christian household, so my first thought at the moment was it could possibly be a demon or something. I remember repeatedly praying over and over again in my head for the Lord to protect me from this evil, and after about 30 seconds, I'm assuming it was that long, but it felt like forever. My hand just let go and I could breathe and move and speak. I was too terrified to move, let alone leave my bed to go to my parents' room, and until I was able to fall back to sleep, I wrapped my arms under the blankets so tight that they weren't exposed. That was one of the scariest things to ever happen to me, and to this day, I don't sleep with my arms outside the blankets despite how hot I am in bed. But I'm curious, what do you guys think it could have been, or have you experienced anything similar? I haven't had much happen to me since that one time, but... It's something that I'll never forget.
This happened when I was six years old. Me and my family were spending summer holidays at a nearby lake and next to our hotel was this huge park. It was surrounded by woods on all sides and in order to get to it, you had to follow the single dirt lane. It was a three minute walk at most and I was playing with my sister here most of the time and the place just never gave off any creepy vibes. The only thing in the park that I never used were these huge monkey bars because I was scared of heights but there were plenty of other things to play with so I never complained. Anyway, my sister got sick one night and we spent the following morning in our apartment. My dad drove to the nearest town to buy some medicine and mum was attending to my sister so I was pretty bored. While she was on the phone with someone, I decided to sneak outside and go to the park to have some fun. I know it was about 1pm because we just finished our late lunch. The park was empty when I got there, which was strange because it was always crawling with kids, but I brushed it off. When suddenly, a group of teenagers appeared from the woods and as soon as they noticed me, they started waving and smiling. Now, I was a shy child and was amazed that older kids would even talk to me, let alone be so friendly. They came to me and started saying how cute I was. There were four girls and two boys and they said that they were 13. I remember one girl vividly because she kind of looked like a character from my favorite childhood book. Her name was Skye and she had short blonde hair and looked tomboyish. Anyway, they started chasing each other around and Sky urged me to join them, which I did. After that, they all climbed the monkey bars on the edge of the park and called for me to come. I went along and I remember how happy I was that the big kids wanted to hang out with me. I couldn't climb by myself because my legs were too short so Sky gave me a hand and pulled me up. When we were on the top of them, Sky let her legs hang over the edge of the bars and told me to try it because it wasn't scary at all. I did that because I didn't want to look like a coward. The other kids were shouting and laughing but then they all just suddenly stopped. They all turned and looked at me with blank expressions, jumped off the bars and ran off quickly. But they ran too quickly. Like, they just kind of warped speed and disappeared. Not to mention that the bars were too tall for someone to jump like that. But the moment that they left, I, I remember getting really scared. I looked around and saw that everything was just pitch black like it was night already. I know this sounds crazy, but I realized that I wasn't sitting on the monkey bars at all, but on top of a tree, and my legs were dangling at least two meters in the air. I felt sick to my stomach, and I started crying and calling my mum, and eventually my parents found me on top of the tree that I couldn't have possibly climbed myself. I spent that night throwing up in the bathroom, and we went home the following day, and mum told me later that they were looking for me the whole day, and even checked the park two or three times, but didn't see anyone. Now, I want to emphasize too that there's just no way that a six-year-old girl would have been able to have climbed the tree that I found myself in. And to this day, I, I think that something tried to hurt me that day using my fear of heights, but just failed for some reason. I'd like to hear any explanations that you guys have because it was confusing and really creepy. So, I'm a 22 year old college senior about to graduate and start medical school in the fall. But this happened when I was in elementary school, so over a decade ago. Over the summer way back then, my mum sent me to YMCA summer camp. I really enjoyed going in every day and hanging out with all my friends from school who also went to the camp, but I especially loved one of the counsellors, Mike. Mike was always sitting in the same spot when I got dropped off in the morning and he would see me walk in and put a huge smile on his face. He would always sit there and play cards or some other board game in the morning while all the kids were arriving. Once the day's scheduled activity started, Mike would always be the counsellor in charge of my group. And he would always just be, well, close to me. As a kid, I didn't know that that was weird. I really liked him, as I said, as I thought that he was a really cool guy as an eight-year-old. Fast forward a couple of years. I don't remember the exact time frame or timeline. Sorry. But my mum and my younger sister and I were out at the state park in the area about half an hour from town where we lived. We had just gone down there to hang out for the day and we had a great time in the playground, walking around the trails, etc. And then we head back to the car. 
When we arrived back at the car, my mum was getting my sister all strapped in and ready for the ride home, and I was getting situated in the back seat as well. Now, our car was in the parking lot, obviously, and there really weren't a ton of other people at the park that day. But the lot was pretty much empty, and so when I noticed that there was a car parked right next to our car, I was like, that's weird. But again, I was a kid and didn't really think anything of it. It wasn't until later that I thought, why would this car park literally right next to us when I could see 50 empty spaces from right here? Anyways, my mum is getting my sister and I all ready for the trip back home, as I said, and suddenly the driver door of the car opens and out pops Mike. My mum recognised him, so she just said hi and continued back to what she was doing. Mike then says, do you mind if I take a couple of pictures of me? He's gotten so grown and I want to remember this. My mum obviously goes, no, you're not going to do that, and shuts the driver's door and locks the car and we leave. And as we're leaving, I can see Mike trying to take a photo like through the windows of the car. A couple of years later, when I was a bit older, my mum told me more details about Mike. My mum at the time was pretty high up in a company that pairs kids with adult mentors. Adults would apply to be paired with a kid and so my mum starts telling me about how one day they were going through the applications to be a mentor and Mike's name popped up. Apparently someone else had interviewed Mike and recommended him for approval into the system. My mum on the other hand essentially vetoed it because she obviously had known Mike from these other experiences and she just got a weird vibe from him that something was off with him. So, finally, we're watching the news at dinner one day a bit later, when they start sharing a story about a man who was arrested, and they show the mugshot of the man, and it's Mike. And the charge? Thousands of images and videos of child porn that he both had made and was just in the possession of. He was actually caught by Border Patrol as he was acting weird when he was trying to cross into Canada, and they decided to search his car, and they found a bunch of it on his computer. They alerted US authorities who then searched his house and they found a ton more of it too. And I am 100% confident that he wanted to add me to the collection. If not for my mum having a great mother's instinct in the Canada-US border, it might have happened too. Also, I have to mention too that it was really creepy how he knew that we were at that park. Because, as I said... It's not the closest one to where we lived. So, I think the room that I live in may be haunted, or is the meeting ground, I guess, for ghosts or something. The dorm is said to be haunted, but I haven't heard of anyone else in the building having room-specific experiences. The first time that we had an inkling that there was something in our room or hall, I had gotten up to go to the bathroom to have a coughing fit so I wouldn't wake up my roommate. I came back, pulled out a cough drop and sat in bed, staying awake and chewing on the cough drop. I didn't want to choke on it in my sleep and as I'm sitting there, I hear two very light knocks on the door. Like someone knocking with one finger or a knuckle. Immediately after the knocks, I hear someone whisper, let me in. I looked over my bed to see if I could see any shadows out of the hall from under the crack in the door, but I didn't see anything. I hear two more light knocks and then nothing, and I thought maybe a hallmate had gotten locked out of the room and didn't want to wake their roommate, but when I asked my friends in the hall the next day, they had no idea and said that they'd rather wake up their own roommates than someone else, which made sense. The next time, about a month later I'd say, I got a little cocky and some friends and I went up to the attic to see if we could get a look inside. But the woman who keeps our building clean tells us that there's a ghost up there. There are crosses drawn on the inside of the windows and some are taped up so no one can see inside. So of course, being the dumb people that we are, we go upstairs to have a look. Now, we didn't see anything but being up there just made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And that night and for two nights after... My roommate and I just couldn't sleep. Even though we were dead tired from our workouts and whatnot, we just could not get to sleep. We both blamed at the time in kind of jest that it was the ghost, but neither of us were really sure why it was happening. The third time, about a month and a half ago, I woke up, facing the wall with my back to the rest of the room. 
to the sound of someone very quietly opening dresser drawers. This went on for a few minutes and I figured that my roommate was getting up early to leave and didn't want to wake me up or something so I just went back to sleep. But I woke up at 7 and she was still in her bed. When she woke up later I asked if she had gotten up and opened up some drawers and she looked confused and said no. Ordinarily I'd blame it on sleepwalking but she never sleepwalks so it was weird. I mean, I'm usually the one who talks and moves in my sleep, but she has no history whatsoever of doing so. Now, the most recent time was just last night, in fact. My roommate's mum was in town, so she went to sleep with her in a hotel, so I was alone in the room. And I woke up at maybe 2 or 3 in the morning, I think, to the sound of glass at my window, maybe, being slammed on. I heard some pacing around the room, and I heard someone sit down and start chewing or something. I remember staying as still as I possibly could in bed, being terrified and trying not to make any sound that would indicate my being awake. Eventually, I heard more pacing and then I think I stopped hearing anything and I let my body relax after being held stiff as a board for what felt like 10 minutes. And I guess I eventually fell back to sleep. I ended up having a nightmare though that someone had crawled all over our walls, destroyed our room and hung up creepy little signs saying things like IGKYN and OID and other stuff, which my subconscious decided to translate, I'm going to kill you next and my name is dead. I'm 100% confident that I was fully awake for these encounters too. It started out as kind of cute and fun and I loved telling people about the ghost in my room but after last night I'm actually pretty scared and I've never felt scared like this in my room before. For some clarity before I tell you the story, I'm a burly guy standing at 6'1". My weekend job is being a bouncer so I tend to be seen as intimidating to many people and in some situations I'll use this to my advantage but I always make that my last resort. My friends tend to call me just a, a big teddy bear and ever since some events prior to this that left me stripped of just many great feelings, I've been left mentally maimed. While dealing with what you're about to hear, I had all of this in my mind and as scared as I was, I was ready to prevent anything from happening to me. And so, now to the story. So, a couple of weeks back, I stopped at a Goodwill on my way home from a friend's place. I've been arranging stuff in my apartment, so I was looking for maybe an extra shelving unit and anything else my space could benefit from. As I'm looking at the VHS tapes, there's an older man right by me also looking in the media section. The people, for whatever reason, seem to not be considerate of other spaces at Goodwill, so I've come to be used to being way too close to people while I'm in there. Anyway, this guy doesn't really seem to care or notice me right away, but when I get up from crouching to look at the bottom shelf, he looks at me and makes a sound like, Mmm. This immediately came off to me as a sound someone makes when they're enjoying food or something they see, but I gave him the benefit of the doubt and tried to think that he was clearing his throat or something. While trying not to read further into the whole thing, I move on with my shopping and a few seconds later I find the same man coming into the aisle that I just found myself in. It's not a huge store and this other aisle was like 10 feet away, so maybe it's just a coincidence. Well, I thought so until he looked me up and down about two times all the way over while making that creepy sound. But this confirmed my suspicion of this old man actually being a creepy piece of crap and at trying to seem undisturbed I moved to the next aisle and this process repeats two more times until I'm just so anxious that I go to the opposite end of the store to make it seem like I'm looking at clothes while also having my back to a wall. I'm there for a few minutes until he leaves and I feel okay enough to continue wandering the store with no worry. I found nothing to buy and so I just decided to leave. Once I'm out of the doors I almost immediately see this man in his car looking at me. I walk in the direction of the van that I was driving that day trying to ignore how far south this situation was gone now and walking past the area where he was parked I hear a car door close and in the reflection of the van windows... I see this man following behind me. I got my keys ready and opened the van door as fast as I could and grabbed my knife that I left on the front seat. 
Once I got the knife ready and in my hand, I had turned to face him, and at this point, he was at the back of the van, and I yelled, get away from me now seemingly unhindered by someone screaming at them with a knife and a death grip and unaware of why they were met with such a response this guy calmly turns around and just goes back to their car there was no expression and no reaction no sound just a turn and a simple walk back to where they came from shaking with adrenaline i wasted no time getting into the van and taking a long way home to assure that i wasn't followed I have no idea why this person did this, and to be honest, I don't want to know what their plans were. So, this is about my experiences that I've had so far with shadow people. First off, I'd like to say that I don't actually believe that these entities are real, and I hope that it's just my eyes and my mind just playing tricks with me and just me being paranoid. But some things I, I just have no explanation for. So, my first encounter was when I was four years old. At the time, I was living in El Salvador, and I was upstairs in my living room watching some television, and as I was watching it, the door to my parents' room just slammed shut. I just assumed it was the wind, but me being all curious, and had just been laying down for some time, I decided to get up and check it out, just to see if my parents had entered without me seeing them or something. So I got up and walked to the room and I opened the door and I went in. I looked around for a while and then suddenly realized that there was a tall black slim figure in the corner of my room. It stood there without movement and it was really just like a, a silhouette of a person that you can't make any details out on. And long story short, I ended up crying and running to my mum where she distracted me and I quickly forgot about it. And after that, I didn't have any more experiences with shadow people until I was about eight. So, I was now eight and had moved to Canada. I started seeing shadow people almost regularly at this point, but it would be in the corner of my eye and when I moved my head to look at it, they would just dart away, so I was always left with a sort of what feeling, like unsure of what I was just seeing. I ignored it and never thought much of it until one day when my mum asked me to go downstairs to get the laundry. But the laundry room was also our furnace room and it was located in the back of the basement behind a counter. I went over there and as I opened the door I was taken by surprise as I saw a tall slim and black shadow person no more than five feet in front of me. My head was at the height of its torso so I couldn't see its face from the angle that I would have to look up to see it but the reason I think this encounter was different is for a couple of reasons. The biggest one being that this one scared me to my bones. And also, the shadow person didn't move at all. It just stayed there, just kind of looking down at me. I slammed the door and I ran as fast as I could upstairs. I didn't say anything to my mum or anyone and I just went into my room. And that night, before falling asleep, I told my mum what I'd seen and it was a shadow person. And, and now's a good time too to say that my family is actually pretty religious. And I ended up telling my encounter to my dad, and he told me, you need to pray. My eight-year-old brain was even more scared by this, though, because I had just gotten confirmation from both my parents that what I was seeing was, in fact, real, and it was out to harm me. Through eight to twelve, I saw shadow people constantly. Even at one point, I saw shadow people of myself, so silhouettes of me around the house. Now, you might think, dude, that's just a shadow, but... I mean, I saw these figures at a day in the other side of the living room while I was in the kitchen. There was just no way that it was my shadow because it was impossible. And it would move while I looked at it, and I don't mean like move away. It would move its arms and head and walk up and down before turning the corner into a hallway, and I followed it once, but it just vanished. Funnily enough, though, the encounters just kind of stopped when I turned 12. And the reason I'm telling you this is because just three months ago... I started seeing them again, in my kitchen behind a counter and down my stairs in the main floor, one even running up my stairs on all fours. I still don't know if that one was just some sort of weird shadow dog or shadow person crawling on all fours. I really don't know how to explain them and I don't know what they are and I hope it's my head playing tricks on me but some things I, I just can't find a rational excuse for. Anyway, 
I'm here to share my experience and see what other people's experiences have been too, as well as what people think of mine. And I'm open to anything at this point.